Hello and welcome to the Exotic Pet Collective, where we talk about tarantulas, scorpions, inverts, and all pets exotic. I am your host, Richard. You may know me from my YouTube channel, The Tarantula Collective. And today we have a special guest joining me to discuss conservation, mantises, isopods, and more. But first, this week's episode is brought to you by thetarantulacollective.com. If you're looking for that perfect gift for the tarantula keeper in your life, head over to thetarantulacollective.com and pick up some Tarantula Collective t-shirts, beanies, hats, or hoodies. There are also stickers, posters, face masks, prints, and all kinds of other tarantula and invert-related merch. While you're there, you'll also find care sheets, a list of reputable tarantula and exotic pet dealers, exotic pet enclosures and supplies, discount codes, and some helpful resources. Find all things tarantula and exotic pet related and stay connected and up to date with everything happening in the collective by signing up for the mailing list so you'll receive the collective newsletter. That's at the tarantulacollective.com. Today's guest grew up in a ranch in Idaho where her father encouraged herping and she would collect mantises from her mother's garden. She recently graduated with a degree in environmental sciences and minors in ethics and food studies from the University of Oregon. She keeps isopods, roaches, mantises, tarantulas, and reptiles, and is the owner and operator of Arthropod Ambassadors. Please welcome to the show, Aaron. Hey, Richard. Hi, Aaron. It's nice to finally meet you face to face, <laughs> even yeah, if it's yeah. virtually. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for coming on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's amazing to be here. All right. So you have, um, let's make sure I get this right. You have a website called Arthropods Ambassadors, and mm -hmm. you also have an Instagram and a YouTube channel all under the same name. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, we started out, um, I got the ambassador idea from working with birds and seeing a, the place I worked with really had a respect for the animals and use them as ambassadors, not just as usual animal zoo sort of set up. And so I, I started the idea of having ambassadorship for insects because we just have amazing animals. And I wanted to catch tarantulas and a couple other groups in there. So arthropods fills that out. But we've got a website that's mostly just what I have too much extra of in my collection up for sale, as well as um, some care sheets. I'm working on care sheets. I really want to take care of an animal for a while and before I write that stuff up. Um, but yeah, and then also Instagram's my main focus. I really, it's the easy way to just have photos that are amazing and easy to reach a larger audience. Uh, I don't do a, fa I just put up a Facebook just to be there, but I don't work with Facebook very much. <laughs> Facebook can be quite toxic. I don't, I don't blame Yeah. You. Yeah. Facebook's its own animal. <laughs> yeah. So you're currently out on the West coast, right? You're out in uh, Oregon. Yep. Yep. Eugene, Oregon, a little bit north. We've got Portland and then it's easy to get down to California. So, and it's close enough to the coast. It's pretty temperate weather. It's got a couple of snowstorms every once in a while, but not too much for weather extremes. Yeah. So what, where did this fascination with arthropods begin? Like how did, how did you even get into this hobby? Uh, yeah, I, I was the kid on at recess that was looking through under logs and trying to find whatever was nearby. i maybe didn't get to eat lunch very early because I couldn't wash the goo that comes on. If you pick up a slug, they've got the the mucus and I found out it stays on your hands when you wash them really, really hard. So I was definitely that kid in kindergarten that the teachers were pulling off and trying to get her hands cleaned up. And I, I don't know, they're just amazing. Every single one of them is so different, just the anatomy and their lifestyles and life ways. Uh, so there's just a little interest in every single species, no matter what your interest is. So I just feel like they, they reach a large audience if you really look at how diverse they are. Yeah. Uh, currently right now, like what, what all's in your collection? Uh, mostly cockroaches and mantises that are, um, actually really closely related. I, I didn't realize it until I got my first hissing cockroach, but they, they really kind of have that mantis face. And then as I did more studying, they're the two closest related on the like life tree of arthropods. Interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, I, I hook people by getting interested in mantises and then suddenly they realize that mantises are pretty much just predatory cockroaches. Um, <laughs> and then the cockroaches also just have so many different uh, biological examples that you can show with them. So they're really nice for a teaching aid. So I got a lot of cockroaches, a couple different mantises. I went to a pet expo in Albany uh, nearby and there were mantises for sale and got my first orchid because everybody has to get their first orchid and then 
got some ghost manises, which I highly recommend in comparison to orchids, even though orchids are amazing. Um, yeah. Also have the, you know, once you're in the hobby, you start looking at all the different critters. So the assassin bugs, we've got a vinegar rune, a couple different scorpions, which I have the same story as you. I didn't really want the scorpions as, at first. And then they're, they're really yeah. fascinating, <laughs> they really <are. laughs> which is weird. Like out of all the arthropods, I was like, eh, centipedes and scorpions, whatever. And then it's like, wow, even you are that, that one-on-one -on -one moment when you realize how interesting they are is something that I want to share with others. Cause it's what makes this ha hobby so amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not 100% sold on centipedes yet. I've got one. The chaos is a little hard to wrap your head around. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> They're a little wild. Yeah. So you've been, uh, how, how long have you been keeping now? I mean, so I had, as you mentioned in the intro, when I was a kid, I would catch uh, usually full-size manises from somewhere else that looked like they were pregnant, and then I'd keep them and feed them until they lay their egg sac. Most of the native mantises are uh, temporal, or they need to, die every season and because they can't live through the winter where I'm from up in northern Idaho. So you catch them, get their egg sac, they die naturally, and then put that in the garden and next year that'll hatch and then there's more mantises around in the area. So I, I started just by doing that and catching, I don't know, I remember my dad bringing home like a giant, one of the atlas moths or whatever that are in the area that have the big giant eye spots that are yay big. Mm -hmm. And we, I remember that having eggs and having caterpillars and then releasing that in the wild. So there was a lot, like the herping is looking for critters and crawlers it's usually reptiles and things like that but that was definitely one of my dad's interactions with me as a kid so a lot of inverts I've thinking back on it I've never been bitten or stung when working with an animal and I'm I'm waiting for that mm -hmm. to change I you know I have old world tarantulas I <laughs> really I really put all money in on that bet um but I've so far it's just not pinching them in a way that they're going to be able to grab you as they get pinched or just respecting how they feel even with the scorpions like they if you let them know you're present with like a feather or something so that they calm down to the touch and don't and realize they're not just being grabbed so i've i've played with a lot of insects even as a small child and never i've definitely been stung by something that i didn't know was there there's been plenty of wasps that have gotten me but as far as working with animals yeah. so far good yeah I, i've never been bitten or stung either it's um yeah it shocks some people when you say that <laughs> you know like i'm waiting for your video on tarantulas that. <laughs> for decades and you've never been bit and it's like no if you if you show them respect and give them their space then it's really not something you gotta you in my experience at least i'm i'm just talking yeah. out of my uh, uh from what i've know i guess like i'm not saying this is a fact but it seems like if you leave them alone and you give them your space they're not gonna bother you gotta go out of your way to upset a tarantula and get bit, it yeah. really seems. Yeah. But yeah. From my point of view. Yeah, I know that maybe there's some species in Australia that will like chase you down, but even some of the chase you down stories, like they talk about it in the desert and there's uh, the the sun spiders or whatever, those weird looking cricket mm -hmm. spider looking things. They chase sure. you to try to get into your shadow because they're a desert species that's trying to find shade. So like mm. these army guys are running for their life because this thing's chasing them when all it's trying to do is find shade in its environment. I don't know. It's just really interesting yeah. to see those kind of <laughs> that is. nuances. Yeah, I I've never kept any of the Australian species. Uh, a lot of people request that I do videos on them. And I'm like, I, yeah. I don't have any. I haven't seen any. Like I got no experience. So kind of like what you were saying, like if I don't have experience on it, it's not information I want to put out there. You know, I'm not going to write a care sheet for something that I've only had for a couple of weeks. Like I, it drives me yeah. crazy. Um, yeah. Not so much in the tarantula hobby or even so, you know, like people that are like doing tarantula videos all the time. I, I don't see that a lot, but I'll see that somebody that keeps primarily snakes or geckos or something like that gets a pet tarantula and immediately does a care video on it. I'm like, this is your, you just said this is your first tarantula. You just got it yeah. two days ago. Like, and they usually do a care sheet by like watching Jungle Bob and then just repeating what he yeah. said. <laughs> it's like, no, not another one. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I had that problem with mantises, which is one of the main focuses for my YouTube channel. I just noticed that a lot of people were, here's the mantis I just got. Here's the things I found out about it. Let's see how it goes. And then they never have another video. And you're just like, oh, I wonder how that mantis went. So I started getting mantises a while ago to start doing videos now since I've had them at least for a life cycle or two and I see a lot of stuff that's just parroted the same thing with the sponge in the water dish for tarantulas you see a lot of people that say ghosts have a few molts difference because most mantis species have a difference between how long the males and females last and how many molts they take till maturity 
but ghosts don't do that. They actually both have the same number of molts and live for the same amount of times, pretty close. But I just see people say that all the time because they had read that care sheet tip. And it's like, no. Yeah. So <laughs> it definitely separates the experience from non. You know, a lot of people online get upset when somebody comes into a Facebook group or something like that and asks for care and husbandry advice. You know, they, they crucify him saying, you know, that you should have done your, your research. You know, that's what Google's for and stuff like that. But in instances like you're just referring to, Sometimes the only thing you find on Google is bad information. Like that nobody's actually done the work and, and put something out there. At least that's ranking in search where people can find it easily. You know, that's, that's why I'm always a little patient with people asking very beginner questions right off the bat, you know, because it's like they, they may have done their research and not trusted it, or they may have done their research and come across like a jungle Bob video or something that's just full of, of outdated information. You know, so we, we got to we gotta be patient with new people when it comes to stuff like that. Definitely. And I, I mean, there's the difference between answer a question or two that they had and then send them towards reputable sites and they can start. That's I don't I feel kind of like a fish out of water when people are like, do you have a care sheet for this? Because I should as somebody who's getting rid of them, but I don't feel like my care sheets, I would just be copy pasting from somebody else's at this point, either because of the, I'll, I'll tell them how I keep them and what I've found kind of differ from care sheets and then send them after two or three care sheets. Cause it also spreads out the love and the hobby. You get people that suddenly know about three or four sources that are reputable, which is important. Yeah. To me. That's always good. I mean, with anything really in life, it, the, the more sources you have, like the wider that base is, the higher your point of success is going to be, you know, like kind of like a pyramid, you know, the wider you make that, that base, the higher the point, the pinnacle will be. Yep. So it's, that's kind of how I try to approach a lot of stuff that, you know, I, I just, I'm not familiar with and I'm trying to learn uh, whether it's tarantulas or reptiles or cameras or editing, you know, whatever it is, I try to like pull from as many sources as I can to, to really kind of have a, a solid base. Um, so yeah, I think that's 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 really cool. Now you just graduated what? from college, right? Yeah, yeah. I went to college. I did a little bit of college in high school for dual enrollment, and then did a little bit of college in Idaho. And they just didn't have quite what I was looking for for a degree. And then when I was down in this area, they had all the degrees I wanted, and I just started gobbling them up. <laughs> <laughs> so how did your your fascination or obsession, maybe we can say, with like arthropods? Uh, affect what you studied in college? Um, I was, so it's just kind of like anthropology with isopods, the idea, that, or in, insects, there's an idea that we as humans have been inter engaging with animals our whole lives for our, for our history. Um, so these smaller groups of people that maybe had a food source that wasn't traditional as today's standards. And so looking into different edible insects was kind of my focus because it was one of the few things that there's much info on. So I, wait, so I you, just, wait, hold I, on I a second. <laughs> you were studying in college insects that people eat I, through time? Uh, more, less studying and more like bothering my teachers in the background. It was pretty hard to let them have them write me, uh, write a paper about it. I, I did some papers <laughs> on butterflies and stuff like that because they're so socially, everybody's stoked on butterflies. And so just the ideas of the ecology behind butterfly releases at weddings and things like that. But my yeah. interest and what I was always, I did the food studies course and it was always what, what cultures eat, what insects, what could we eat in the future to help ourselves with sustainability, not even a directly eating. There's a big cricket protein phase fad right now and that and mealworms and things like that. And, mm -hmm. eat, you know, eating it in an overpriced hippie bar is cool and it's great to show that support. But at the same time, looking at using mealworms or crickets to feed protein hungry animals that we then eat instead of using soybeans and things that are being overproduced, use something that can maybe the crickets or the cockroaches eat waste. And then you feed that to the chickens in a way that makes a more sustainable cradle to cradle approach. So, yeah, I actually I started raising mealworms again because I was working with quail and quail need a higher protein feed than most chicken foods on the market provide. So I was just raising mealworms to supplement my quail. And it made me realize that a lot of backyard chicken keepers should be keeping bugs. <laughs> so there's a whole group <laughs> of people that it's they, they would really benefit from being able to throw their kitchen waste into a cockroach bin that, that then feed their chickens the cockroaches and they get better eggs. So yeah, those kind of cycles within food yeah. studies and within ethics were really interesting to me. Yeah, it definitely sounds interesting. Um, I, I do, like my algorithm, 
online, my feed or whatever, is is, is kind of skewed at the moment because I was searching for ways, places to buy uh, mealworms and crickets online, just have them shipped directly to me. And now it's like constantly suggesting these protein bars made from crickets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, yeah. I really don't want to eat that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a company in town that when that's when I started talking to the teachers about it, they're like, there's a, there's a cricket protein company. And I was like, no, I'm looking more for like what other insects could be. Everybody's just stoked on mealworms and crickets, but there's a lot of different species mm-hmm. of insects. That's <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've always find it fascinating. Uh, cultures around the world eat things like scorpions and tarantulas, uh, stuff yeah. that like I never would consider eating them, but you know, with the way things are right now, sometimes, uh, you know, with, with, yeah, just politics and viruses and stuff like that. Sometimes my mind goes to survival mode and I'm like, if, if worst case scenario happened, like I've got gas masks and I've got a basement full of tarantulas. So, you know, <laughs> if I have time. to eat them, I've got like a farm down here. <laughs> yeah. And their, their venom's going to be located in a way that they're not going to have. I mean, as long as you can like singe off those urticating hairs, you should be good. Um, but yeah. And the other, just the idea that I don't know. I've always been kind of rude. I grew up in Northern Idaho. We're all backyard or backwoodsy people. And I've always just kind of said, you know, if you, if you starved in the woods, you might've just not been looking at your options. Cause there's all sorts of critters you could have been nibbling on. I mean, obviously keep an eye on poisons, but at the same time, like you could eat some earthworms <laughs> for a few days. But, yeah. There's grubs everywhere yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, not Idaho, probably not as remote as as you guys are, but I'm in West Virginia, and it's mm-hmm. it's uh, pretty sparsely populated here. You spend a lot of times as a kid, you know, a lot of your time spent out in the woods, and you know, with Boy Scouts and stuff like that. That survival mm-hmm. training was always my favorite. You know, just finding what you could eat as far as plants and grubs and and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. it, I remember uh, we did a winter survival once when I was in high school, and that was the most brutal because <laughs> mm-hmm. everything was you know frozen and there was snow everywhere but it, it yeah there's there's I, I don't know why like i i would be okay with eating earthworms or grubs or something like that but i don't know if i could force myself to eat a tarantula like yeah. i think maybe i just have like an emotional attachment to them now <laughs> it's like and it's yeah, funny because yeah and a lot of the cultures that i've looked into they kind of feel the same way about each other, even though they're both eating arthropods of some sort. They're like, ew, they eat scorpions. And the other are like, ew, they eat grubs. And it's like, oh, <laughs> what a weird thing to nitpick. Um, but yeah, I guess if you love your scorpions, you're going to have to figure out how, which grubs are on the menu. And that's like Australia. There's a big grub hunting culture there. And I know that there's a, a culture for like agave worms from an agave moth that's in Mexico. And so, that, yeah, there's it's 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 surprisingly common for how little is known about it and so yeah it's it's an interesting thing to bring to light because then you start having that like idea again of well if this animal was useful to humans and what what's the cultural significance behind that and is it worth you know looking into protecting agave areas that have these moths in order to keep that cultural interest so yeah, and that, I think that's a, it's a cool way to kind of get people into conservation. You know, I was looking at the cultural aspect of it. And because I think sometimes people, you know, when they think about conservation, um, and we talked about this briefly uh, before we started recording, but, you know, it's when I think of conservation, I'm thinking penguins, polar bears, um, you know, like uh, elephants, and rhinos, and stuff like that. But what we're learning, I guess, a lot like right now is that things like bumblebees are exceedingly more important to the ecosystem, you know, and, and, and other arthropods, uh, insects, stuff like that. Um, so ha- like what you were discussing, um, t- kind of tying that in to get people interested in the conservation aspect of these, you know, you kind of initiate that sort of, um, interest in them. And then people seem a little more willing to care, I guess. Um, yeah, and so bumblebees are an easy one because they're adorable. <laughs> but um, that's the other thing is like the idea I that, guess. Is, like, yeah, right? The like bees are important, but people usually think honey bees because yay honey. But there's actually a whole group of native bees, hundreds of species that are in tune to the native flowers in a way that they emerge at a time that honey bees would still be huddled in there. Uh, and they, yeah, there's a whole different pollination schedule that you capture when you use your mind to think of the large vast bee populations that are not on the radar because they're not the honeybee but we True. but we need the ambassador anyway like the yay honeybees but use that to kind of navigate into yay all bees 
which is yeah. Is so it sounds like just from our conversation that uh, conservation is a pretty uh, big thing um, as far as you're concerned. Like, uh, wh- how are you involved in in conservation? And that's it's it's not so much conservation as much as the idea that conservation can also engage positively for humans. Uh, so that's that's my interest in conservation is on the ground movements that are. Uh, benefiting everyone, not just cutting people out of an area. There's a lot of really questionable things we've done in the name of conservation that don't realize that people are part of the landscape. Um, And that's uh, whether it's natives or traditional knowledge that's being lost because people have been on that landscape. And there's a common Western idea that that's not something that is natural. Um, So using animals with conservation in a way that it benefits everyone. I, I mentioned to you the the bee example in Africa. They w- there's issues with the the elephants raiding crops, and so as as a culture, they're having issues with elephants that we don't understand, um, and in, and therefore some elephants are being taken out because they're problem animals. And so one of the biologists realized that elephants are terrified of bees, and she she even put a recording of bees where they usually kind of hang out and turned it on once the elephants had relaxed and they just took off without even questioning what it was. They're just like, no, nope, <laughs> bees, I'm out. And so the idea of they made these fences that there's like a beehive and then another beehive and they're all connected by wires that if you move them, the bees get upset because their hives jiggled. So they're not even really that difficult to design the fences. They're not like taut elephant proof fences because elephants are getting through everything. They're really intelligent. Um, but And so now not only do you have elephants that don't even want anything to do with that fence line, but you get honey, which so the, the local population gets to show, uh, you know, gets to grow through their agriculture with the elephants still present on the land. And they have a new honey that's elephant safe honey. So the any kind of tourism in that area is stoked on the ecological situation. So. Yeah, just that kind of weird nitpicking, like kind of roundabout conservation is really what interests me more than, I mean, of course we need to save habitat and all that kind of stuff, but I think if we don't value saving it as people and we don't value what's on in that habitat and what we can learn or get from that, it's not going to have enough momentum with the current capitalist structures. (laughs) So if we value something, (laughs) boy, we're good about it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that, that, that happens all around the world. Like it's um, that trying to, to find that balance between what people need in a capitalist society, you know, um, balanced against the ecology of the area uh, can be very difficult. Like, like what we see happening in Brazil. I mean, they're, I mean, they're intentionally burning down rainforests and stuff like that for farmland and urban sprawl and decimating native species there while at the same time, not wanting anybody to export those species. <laughs> and, you know, it causes a, a lot of issues. Yeah. Um, and, and it's like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's almost like there's this cognitive dissonance. Like, we don't want to do anything to save these species, but we're also going to destroy them, <laughs> you know, or at least their habitat. You know, and it's, it's kind of frustrating, at least like from where I am, to see these like beautiful tarantula species that I'm really into and, and knowing that they're, um, you know, their habitat's being destroyed, but also at the same time, understanding that people need land to farm, you know, you know, and, and I, I can understand, I guess, I try to put myself in other people's shoes in that situation. Like if I owned, if I needed to expand my farm so I can make, make enough money for my family to survive, um, would I care about tarantulas that are living in the, the trees or the forest, you know, just beyond my property line? Exactly. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult line to, to walk. Yeah. And I, I think I mentioned it to you, the, the idea of, you know, the pet trade's always blamed for taking these animals out with poachers and things like that. But the idea of actually networking in a way that maybe you're extracting those animals through local resources and giving back to that community in a way that they start valuing those animals. And it's not just poached one or two poachers that go to all different areas that they know these tarantulas are at, but the tarantula hobby is reaching out and saying, hey, this area has this amazing animal. We would like to support this area because of that. And it's the same thing with yeah, you just all of a sudden that that species is given value and that area is given value. But with Brazil currently, there's a lot of political things where they just don't want to be valued in that way. There's a lot of, you know, racial divide. So it's it's not the people that are in the area that's being deforested that have 
been doing the deforesting. But I, like I said, Hank, Hank Green does a much better video on that. The Brazil is being burned video is eye opening for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, um, I, I was talking, I guess it was, um, Gar from Arachnitude. Um, he was on the podcast earlier and we were kind of touching on a similar topic and, you know, it giving value to the people in a location, like, uh, some kind of monetary value to, you know, the species that are endemic or native to their area, it can be very beneficial. It's it, it, the, the method worked for coffee at least, you know, like it, for, it was like these huge companies, you know, just farming these massive acres of coffee beans and they were paying the workers like slave wages almost, you know, for picking them and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you started getting these coffee, like, um, like brew, not brewers, uh, roasters. That's what they're called. Um, looking for like doing just pretty much the fair trade coffee, finding small farms and investing in that population, you know, and that, that small little village or something to get higher quality coffee, uh, and it paying them a lot more, a lot, you know, a lot better wage at least than what they would get just as a picker on some huge agricultural kind of, um, you know, massive farm. And, and it's, it's both given us a better coffee product and has also, you know, really helped kind of lift up that small village or those, those small farmers, um, to make a lot more money than they would. So it would be, it would be nice to kind of take that model and apply it to, snakes and scorpions and tarantulas and, and, and you know other inverts and, and arthropods i think it would because people i don't i don't think in, if you're not in the hobby you don't see any value to them at all you know mm -hmm. yeah and that's like you said the hobby's growing so i think that would be this smart way to to grow the hobby because you're also gonna you know they they use that bias of oh the pet trade just takes everything out that they use that to make things like the lacy act and things like that and so i feel like if we move towards sustainable conservation through and the other side of it is a lot of times I feel like a conservation says save the Amazon save the Arctic and they don't really talk about how important your ecosystem where you are is and how amazing just outside is and what amazing critters what beetles you have that might be just like outstandingly neat because if you focus there you have a lot more voting influence same same thing as following these tarantulas, getting the people in the area where the tarantulas are at to be valued saves that land better than sending five dollars to who knows where. And <laughs> and so when yeah. people are interested in what's in their backyard and that becomes worldwide because of, you know, tr the pet trade, I, I think that that would really show a lot of conservational influx that we're not seeing. Yeah, I know a, a guy lives around here. He's um, a professor um, at one of the local universities and he's in. Um, I don't think he's a herpetologist, but he really likes snakes. I, th I think he's more into uh, crayfish or something like that is what he actually teaches. But, he, you know, he's, he's in uh, the biology kind of department at the university. And I, I was a follow We were on Facebook or something like that. Uh, and he had posted some pictures of his backyard. And he had just essentially just took in a bunch of, like, tires and, um, you know, like cut down trees and stuff like that and created a, um, an environment for, like, the native species of snakes to kind of thrive yep. like in his own backyard. And he's like, it, it's awesome because one, I, I've got a lot of snakes living back here now that I find extremely fascinating. And now I don't have to mow my lawn. <laughs> like I don't, I'm, I just kind of let it overgrow and do its thing in a, in a safe, responsible way. So his neighbors aren't complaining, but it does give, you know, it kind of, it gives a home to a lot of snakes, but also, you know, other native species of, of insects and, and mammals and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's uh, it was a pretty cool idea. I, I was tempted to do that myself. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of had the same thing when my I mentioned my mom raises mealworms for bluebirds, and we we showed up at the ranch and there were just mis you couldn't go outside without mosquitoes, and so you're spraying yourself with who knows what nasty mosquito sprays, and they didn't even really care. They were pretty tenacious. I don't know if you have mosquitoes in that area as well, um, but mom started feeding bluebirds on uh, these little flat lids with mealworms in it, and we had maybe two pair originally. And now when I visit, there's probably 40 or 50 birds that like hang out on the fence line at a certain time of the day waiting for their mealworms. And there's a ton of swallows. My dad allowed swallows to kind of build their nests under the barn and this and that. So it ended up being just putting some mealworms out to sustain the local wildlife. Now there's no mosquitoes. If you go all the way down into the bottom of the canyon, you can find some mosquitoes where the birds aren't at. But I like... 
I was away for college for most of the like ecosystem change. And I came home, I was like, there are no mosquitoes. Where really? Like, and that's just, it's just such a long, slow journey. But all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, just, just that little bit of animal support created an ecosystem that I'm now more comfortable in, which is less pesticide use. Cause I don't have to get rid of the mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you, uh, what exactly are you doing? Um, you've got Arthropod Ambassadors where you're selling stuff online, but you're also doing uh, like a, a mobile zoo or explain that. Cause I, yeah, I, I know I I'm mean, not going to do, a very, yeah, do it mean, justice. Oh no, you're fine. It's, it's pretty much trying to do what you do with your channel. And so I have so many critters that are amazing. And I did a, a table one time at an event for a farm that I was working at and had just some mantises and some isopods and different species of cockroaches set up. And I had a line at that table all day from the like CSA people that wanted to see, what do you mean there's a roly poly that's striped and just things I didn't, you know, once you're in the hobby enough, you don't realize how so many other people are amazed by these things that you just have been feeding a while. So I decided I needed, I need to take them on in a way that I can get them to other people and to see, and the videos are amazing, especially when you do macros like you do, like, ah, you can really be there with the tarantula, but being able for people to just like look at this animal and see how it's interacting or reacting to them is the kind of thing you remember as a kid when like the, the people with the birds or natural animals come into the classroom or something, it just hits us differently. And I think that that's really a important part of the being able to engage people. So I'm hoping to just bring either do specimens so you can see I have some pinned specimens. This is an amplipygy molt and things like that so that people can really have a one on one and then have some of the tarantulas. Uh, the tarantulas are going to be tricky because I want to show how they web. I feel like that's a really important aspect of tarantulas is their home designers. Like they'll pull stuff up and this amazing designer thing that I didn't realize about them either. And I want to show that off. So trying to figure out a way to do maybe exoterras. You can see one of my GBBs right there. Um, that slide in or some other kind of enclosures that can be taken out so that animal can always be in that enclosure and design it for itself. Whereas the enclosures for the mantises, they don't really modify their habitat. So I could just have enclosures that I can put mantises into and take them back out of and not have to worry. Their, their display doesn't have to do as much as with their house working. So trying to figure out all that kind of stuff. And then it's going to be pretty much a hand cart about bicycle cart size that I can put underneath a pop-up if it's at an actual event, or I can just take it on the sidewalks at bigger things. Um, it's pretty nice weather down here, so I don't have to worry too much about cooling it. I'm probably just going to have some heat stress strips for certain species, but yeah, working on it. Got the welder. We're learning how to weld so we can make the frame and you know, it's, <laughs> it's a whole project. You're going all out. Yeah. I, I mean, I, they represent themselves amazingly, but whatever I can do to really support that. So how did, how did you get into like actually selling these, uh, you know, different, like you, you sell isopods and mantises and yeah, the goat, the ghosts are my main thing. I have too much of it's, it's mostly just, I want more people to see more bugs. And the easiest way to do that is for people to have bugs. And the mantises are great because you've got a, about a year commitment at most, which is a bummer about mantises, but at the same time, especially for children, it, it gets you into that cycle of life and death. Like things do pass away. They get old. I've, I've had pets all my life, so I can handle it really well, but maybe learning that with a mantis is the first time that kid's going to experience that kind of feeling. And so engaging people that way, just with like life lessons and then having something that when I don't, I, with pet stores, it's always been such an ethical thing. Like you get a six-year-old, a parakeet, like, whoa, that's a, that was a big commitment yeah. that you didn't, you just, I could never work at a pet store, <laughs> but so the idea of not, yeah. the turtles not, are the uh, ones that blow not, my mind. Yeah. Not, you know, saddling somebody with that commitment accidentally. And, and so that's like, I, I was uh, in Florida and for whatever reason I got a, a, you know, this idea in my mind that I wanted uh, some kind of turtle and I went to the pet store and they had the, they were like about the size of a silver dollar, a uh, little uh, with it, red eared sliders. And I was like, Oh, this is perfect. And, you know, of course, I'm like, you know, 18, 19 years old, something like that. Young guy, um, not really, just very impulsive and uh, didn't do any research at all and got them, got it all set up. And then, like, after I had everything set up, what I thought it would want, I finally did a little bit of research and realized this thing lives for like 30 or 40 years or longer and it gets huge and like, it's going to grow to the size of the tank. And 
before I, within a few years, it seemed that we went from like a, a 10 gallon tank to a 40 gallon tank yeah. and it was still growing. I was like, this is, this is getting out of hand. Yeah. yeah and like, yeah. nobody told me anything like the, you they know, just it, want to sell it, it was my responsibility, <laughs> you know, but the people at the pet shop didn't say, Hey, it's, this looks cute, but it's going to smell really bad and be a lot of work and it's going to get big. Like nobody, yep. nobody gave me a warning or a heads up about that. Yeah. And that's, that's the other thing is we've, a lot of keepers have made mistakes of that sort and just being open to talking with people about it. Cause I think a lot of those experiences, people hide them because they feel like they're going to get negative attention for bringing it up and any even negative issues with why, why did you do that to your tarantula or how could you do that to your mantis? And it's like, maybe we shouldn't come at it that way because we're all, we all make mistakes and being able to learn from others mistakes means less mistakes made. And it's also just gives almost a brotherhood. I, my parents got me an iguana when I was a kid. I, we, I had this cute little sand species of s lizard. I'm guessing it got impaction because there wasn't as much hobby info on not keeping them on sand. And we had a sand tank because it's a desert species. Leopard gecko stuff. <laughs> it wasn't a leopard gecko, but, you know, that same kind of now the hobby is super informative about things like that. Um, but, yeah, I got a I got a they got me another lizard and they got me an iguana, which grew like five feet and I loved him and I tried hanging out with him as much as I could. Um, he bit, we'd put his cage inside and out to get UV, good UV in the summertime. And my dad was bringing him in one time and just grabbed him without like waking him up and he bit him really bad. And so then he kind of wouldn't let me work with him because he felt like it was a dangerous animal, which just, you know, bad cycle. But it's, it's, you know, that's something that I've had an experience with that if somebody was interested in iguana, I would definitely want to say my experience, but if you're working at a pet store and just want to move one of the seven tiny baby iguanas stuck in that corner over there, like you're not going to get that engagement and people are afraid to ask about it because there's, you know, people can be kind of aggressive in the hobby. But at, at this time I've got nothing. I have needs UVB or UVA. I've got the, the leopard geckos and the hog nose and I've kind of focused on not getting something that needs a basking area and this and that, because I just, I feel like my husbandry, I could do it, but I don't want to saddle future Aaron with having to still do it 10 years from now. So, and the, the leopard gecko, I'm definitely on, I think some of them can have substrate. And I think the very expensive morphs also have some neurological problems that they would eat substrate and not even think about it. And people have experienced that and said no to everything. So it is safest to do no, but like my normal leopard gecko that I hang out with, that's my buddy, Princess Snow very focused, able to eat, grabs her food. My really fancy tangerine leopard gecko male will grab a hold of the, I have him on some of the like shelf liner and he'll go to get a mealworm and he'll grab that shelf liner and he will try his hardest to eat that shelf liner. <laughs> like he'll rip at it and just like, this is definitely the worm I just tried to eat. And so between those two animals, I would, I don't have princess on, on substrate, but I would trust her on it. But him, I would never put on substrate so it's definitely gecko to gecko but and so it's safest just to be like don't even think about it but yeah it, it definitely keeps a contrasting experience in the hobby that is has kept that as a hot topic <laughs> yeah yeah we, russ and i uh from aquarimax talked about that in the last podcast i think um because i i right now i have both of my leopard geckos in bioactive enclosures on substrate and mm -hmm. but they're not fancy at all like like uh pet shop they don't need to be they're amazing uh, geckos <laughs> and and they, they they're doing they're doing well but you know i have uh my my son every time we go to the pet store which is very frequently they have those bearded dragons and they're maybe like six nine inches long and he begs me for them and i'm like buddy you don't understand yeah <laughs> like you're gonna go to college soon you know in like five six years and then i have to take care mm -hmm. of this huge five foot long 40 lizard. gallon extra tank yeah like, oh. yeah i was like we're not doing that <laughs> No. And that's, it's kind of nice to have friends that have critters too, so that you can kind of get, I have a friend who has a milk snake and every once in a while I'm like, can I, can I play with the milk snake for a little bit? Like <laughs> I have hog nose and I understand yeah. it. it's similar, but like, I just want to hang out with something else, but I don't want to buy it. Cause, cause I'll have <laughs> yeah, I have a happen. milk snake, but I never see it. Yeah. They're pure chaos to handle. Like you just can't stop. They just, yeah. Or the one I, the one I was mm -hmm. working with is just, yeah. Compared to the hog nose, they just like hang on and or there for the ride. Yeah. Like my ball python will, it's very chill and relax and we'll just kind of wrap around and cuddle up. But, uh, man, that, that milk snake, the first thing it does is, is musk all over me and then just try to fly out of my hands. And it's like, yeah, okay, I'll just let you be. It just stays in hiding most of the time. 
comes out to eat or shit. That's about it. Um, and I've got a couple of king snakes, and and they're uh, we got the the eastern king snake is very friendly. Um, you know, I, I enjoy handling her a lot. The California king snake I have, it just wants to eat, and it doesn't understand that sometimes I'm just trying to change its water, not give it a mouse. <laughs> it just starts striking. It's like, all right, I'll give you your space, buddy. Well, and it's so great that you can actually judge animals that way. You can understand that there's their food response involved, and yeah, that's. A lot of people would just say, I have a meanest snake. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's not. Yeah, I don't think he's mean. He's just, um, he just likes to eat. He's a little pig. But you got um, all kinds of, uh, like you sent me some ghost mantises. Um, mm -hmm. Wait, mm -hmm. yeah. And there was there was one that we, like, I can't remember. You, you probably know. It's It's some kind of very, it's a beautiful mantis but it's apparently very difficult to keep so i think somebody else you got an orchid at the same time and you got a dead leaf at the same time i sent you the ghosts and yeah. i those two are from somebody else but i don't know who but you gave me the credit for the orchid that one time and i was just like oh i think i text <laughs> i think i you were on live chat and i was in the live chat like oh no 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 <laughs> don't give me yeah. that credit oh man uh, they're beautiful yeah. and like you said they they can be finicky. The ghosts are definitely bomb proof in comparison to most mantises and yeah. the cats, which are behind me here. There's some cat mantises that they're like for their shape. They're super elongated. So you'd think they'd have molting problems and they're doing really good. I haven't actually had any issues with it, but yeah, well, this is i yeah. I've never had this species, uh, I, but I've seen a lot of pictures of it online. It's some kind of, I don't want to say it's a devil orchid or mantis or something like that, but uh, I was I was looking at and, and people were saying it needs like a a basking spot the of like devil the devil's flower the Ida, Ida Bolica. yeah devil's flowers are one of those like everybody in the hobby sees it and wants it and I came across a deal where they weren't as expensive he was doing communal deals so that he could get feedback on how they acted as a communal because they had been on the they had been on the hobby list for like sixty to eighty or yeah about forty to sixty dollars each for a baby and when you get an animal that expensive and it passes away that's a bummer and that's definitely a devil's flowers devil flowers i ended up setting up a pretty successful system which was a really cheap um green, indoor greenhouse like those three tier three shelf two foot wide three foot wide greenhouses they fit the mantis enclosure okay. perfectly and then i put an incandescent i think 40 watt, 50 watt bulb above them because they need to bask at 115 degrees, which is outrageously hot, but they want yeah. about 40 to 100% humidity. So I just had to put them in a greenhouse and throw an incandescent in it. And then I did a cocoa fiber bottom. And after I finally set all that up, I did a couple of different setups and I lost a mantis here and a mantis there. Some of them just never did molt. Some of them had miss molts. I have a lot of them in resin because they were still pretty expensive. <laughs> so trying to save the yeah. losses I've had in a different way. But they're definitely, if you have them set up right, they were great once that happened. All the rest of mine got to adult. But yeah, if you're not ready for that, it's a big expensive mistake. <laughs> so it, it that's what the ghosts are like amazing. The ghosts yeah, I mean, it once once the setup, it was you know an extra hundred dollars in equipment, just getting the light, the heat mat, and that greenhouse. So if you're already spending forty dollars on a bug, it's not too bad. <laughs> but they they definitely are one of those like everybody wants it, everybody has a bad experience, everybody's super like bah, why would I, why did it reminds me of those uh, sun spiders? I, like everybody wants a sun yeah. spider. People ask me yeah. all the time if I have any, and it's like they don't do well in captivity. That's all I've ever heard about them. Yeah, I haven't really heard anybody that's kept them successfully. And I was at a, uh, a reptile expo, and they were selling them. Um, they had like, I mean, they had maybe ten or twelve specimens there, and I was like, well, it's here, and the guy's giving me a really good deal on it, so I'll, I'll grab one. And the, the poor thing didn't survive the trip home. <laughs> it's like by the time I got home and unboxed it, and you know, and put it in its enclosure, it was already very lethargic. I did everything I could, and a uh, poor guy just did not survive like more than a week or a few days after uh, getting Like, I think he was already on his way out when I picked him up off the table. Um, and, and since yeah, then, it's like, I really don't even want to get involved with that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to avoid with the insect hobby. So most of the species, I work with some species like the devils. I would not have sold them. 
And currently I have a few orchids that I have available and I'm making people go to a form, Google forms and fill out all of these things to make sure they've done their research. So, cause I, I also don't want to so just you're, give you're, them to people who have money. Yeah. A little, I mean, I, they don't have to pass it. They just have to go through it. And then if they get things wrong, I'm like, Hey, just to let you know, the males are super small and only live for four months and they need a smaller enclosure for their, when you have a, I don't know. Everybody that gets an animal is like, whoa, big, huge enclosure is going to be awesome. But really with mantises, they need to be able to find their food. And so as long as the, the enclosure kind of needs to be smaller and simpler for the teeny tiny babies, once you get a larger animal that can like engage with a 10 gallon, sure, but don't put a nymph in a five gallon enclosure or an exoterra nano. So yeah, just trying to kind of like the orchid man, what's the lifespan on a female orchid? I've heard almost up to two years from one of uh, mantidologies, one of my main mantis go-to guys. And he said that he had a female live for quite some time, but they're also super prone to uh, bacterial infections. And with needing the high humidity as well, it's just a, yeah, it's kind of a double whammy. You've got a species that has bacteria issues and needs high humidity, which causes bacterial issues. And that's the, yeah. the main, like I found out about it the hard way with bad feeders, but it's called the black death. And uh, it's about as bad as it sounds. Mantis keepers, it's a, a bacterial infection that mantis keepers, you see them, you see the mantis throw up black goo and you're pretty much, it's too late. So that's one that you can get from just having crickets. That's the, the controversy about crickets is mostly because a lot of crickets are kept in conditions where they have bacterial issues that they themselves are living through. They can handle it. But if that bacterial issue passes to an animal that can't handle it, then you get that. And there's also something about, I'm not quite, I don't I have an experience for myself, but I've heard a lot online. Carrots are supposed to have some sort of a antifungal chemical that can hurt mantises. And I'm not sure if it's true or not, but a lot of mantis feeders forbid carrots for the feeders of the mantis. And that's one of the things when you're keeping mantises, you're not keeping mantises, you're keeping mantis food and you get the perk of having a mantis. So a lot of, yeah, you get those little babies, you're gonna need to learn about fruit fly cultures. And when they get a little bit bigger, a lot of species prefer flying insects. They don't need them. You can kind of hand feed a lot of them, but it's a lot easier to throw flies in than try to like get one of the cats to eat a super worm because you have to kind of touch it to their mouth and then they'll kind of start engaging with it. But a lot of times they're so t intimidated by you that it takes a second to get a feeding response. So yeah, the, the yeah. feeders are yeah. I don't have most any, of the mantis uh, training. I don't have any flies. <laughs> what I've been feeding my mantises are, and now I have to look at that. But I've been feeding them crickets and mealworms, um, just and they take it right off the tongs every time. I haven't had any. And occasionally, I can drop one in there, and it'll they'll see it climbing up the stick or something and, and pounce on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I I definitely suggest to people like if you're having an issue with feeding your mantis, just put it in. You can have a beautiful cage and take it out for feeding time and put it in an enclosure where it can spot that food. So if you don't have flying animals, you can still engage them with ground prey as long as that ground prey is not going to take off and hide in the substrate. So it takes a second of husbandry to move them in and out, but it's worth it for a well-fed animal. Also, I feel like a lot of tarantula keepers feed their mantises a lot less than they need. I've seen on a few different shows, it seems like the the how often you feed tarantulas is about a quarter as much as t the metabolism that mantises need. So I see that as a husbandry's mistake pretty commonly. How often should you be feeding a mantis? I look more at abdomen size than how often. I mean, I definitely make sure mine are pretty plump. I never let one of my mantises stay skinny unless she's after a molt for a couple of days and let them harden up. But yeah, it's it's more of a make sure they look like little Christmas tree bulbs and not little pieces of paper kind of a thing. And so it's 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 a body shape more than um, I'm probably honestly probably feed my tarantulas wrong because I definitely feed them and then their body's fat. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm just not going to feed you. Anymore. You're huge. <laughs> so I, I do the opposite. <laughs> my uh, I have a, a dead leaf mantis. She's huge. Um, and I just fed her a, uh, a hornworm. I had some small green hornworms and I, it was just, I was feeding tarantulas uh, for a, a, the fatal fangs uh, kind of competition oh, they got. Nice. I was trying to get some good yep. footage yep. and uh, nobody was really doing anything exciting on camera. And I was like, well, I need to feed my mantis. So I pulled it down and, uh, you know, just kind of dangled it in front of her, see if she, and she like 
leaped and grabbed that thing and and just and took it all down. And I was like, wow, I didn't think you would eat something that big. Yeah. <laughs> but, and that's another thing I've heard. I've heard a few people and I've read in the Mantis Keeping book by Oren um, that mantises won't overeat. Uh, this guy is a must have. Must have. You have to get the uh, Keeping the Praying Mantis by Oren McMongol. Um, but also some of the things in here I feel are a little bit opinion based through his experience, which is an important thing to build on. But I've definitely had experiences where I've put too many fruit flies into a certain species enclosure and they've eaten themselves to bursting. And I've come back and been like, what happened? And it was definitely just a miscalculation. Most mantises won't do it. And most of the species I sell won't do it. But I have had it happen. And then when I was reading that book, he was just like, oh, that doesn't happen. And I was like, well, oh. <laughs> you got empirical evidence that it proves it yeah, does. <laughs> yeah, which is, I mean, yeah, maybe maybe it was super full and fell from the top. There wasn't any sign of that. But maybe it fell and had an impact when it was full. There's definitely ways around it. But yeah, I, uh, from my experience, some species will overeat. Maybe if they have hadn't eaten in long enough that they were kind of desperate or something of that sort. Like one day without food means more desperation and overeating compared to something that's slowly fed, which again is a reason to continually feed your mantises and not do just like once a week. So uh, as soon as we're done with this podcast, I'm going to feed my mantises, <laughs> but <laughs> not too much. Few <laughs> 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 so what's a, what's a good beginner species of mantis if somebody was wanting to get their first one? So, I mean, it really depends on how interested you are. If if you want to see what it's like to keep a mantis, I would suggest going outside and getting interested in your local ecology and finding a mantis that you can then, if you're having issues feeding it or keeping feeders or anything like that, you can release back out into its natural environment. That's It also just engages people with the outdoors in a way that I think is really important. So there's native mantis species. I have found that raising baby mantises of certain species, the, the ones you can find like at garden stores, um, when they hang from an enclosure, un like a, a natural, like you're in a butterfly cage, so you all hang from the top, they'll actually start to kind of fold their abdomens down in a way that really affects their ability to molt or eat. So there are certain species of natural mantises that are harder to keep than you find a lot of the tropical exotic species. But if you're committed to keeping an animal its entire life cycle, I would definitely say ghosts, ghost mantises, Philocrania paradoxa um, are amazing. Uh, they just in singular, they're a little smaller, but in singular, they just are fantastically built, just ornate species. They don't need any temperature regulation of any type. They can handle warm or cold. They change their color uh, depending on their environment. So you can actually get green females that'll turn like grassy after if they're kept a little less dry. So you can actually kind of realize your husbandry skills because you'll, it'll be reflected in the color for your mantis. So it'd be like, oh, I must keep my mantises dry because they're all grass colored, but they still can survive it just fine. Um, but yeah, ghosts are for sure. Um, like I was saying, the cat eye mantises, I've been not having very much trouble with. So I would suggest that species at this point because I've kept them long enough to not really have issues. Spiny flower mantises are pretty amazing like half the time. I hear people keep them exactly the same way, myself included, and they'll they'll be thriving, they'll be doing great, and then all of a sudden you'll get some sort of a black death issue, which is a feeder problem, or you'll, yeah, they're, they're a little sensitive randomly, and it seems like maybe it's, they. I think they need to be kept warmer and drier, but with a misting schedule, but not consistently humid. There's just, they seem a little nitpicky, but other than that, they're pretty hardy, and then if you go to the end of the scale, you get orchids or pretty easy to care for but definitely not a beginner species and then we were talking about devil's flowers just yeah try everything else first <laughs> yeah work your way up yeah yeah that's the ladder <laughs> yeah but i i the ghost mantis i have like they they're all in the um the ones you send me they're all in the exact same style of enclosure and like i said i'm a pretty uh, i mean i assume that it's, it's the exact same setup um, and, you know, feed them and, and miss them and everything around the same time. Uh, and, and half of them are kind of like a brownish color and the other half are a bright green color. And I'm like, what, yeah. what is the difference? Like, how is so this? So there'll be genetics as well. Is it a dark brown? Yeah. Like one of them's kind of a, a dark brown. 
And yes, the other one's so like a, yes. A light only green. females can turn green. So if they have green genetics, oh. but they're male, and then also some don't have the green genetics, so they'll just stay a darker brown and then turn a lighter brown if they're in humidity. Because everybody wants a green ghost, and I'm always just like, okay, there's like a percentage chance they could be a green ghost, and then also you have to take care of them to make them a green ghost. So it's like a double, <laughs> double test. But yeah, they, they they have a genetic component as well as the green change. Interesting. And you also uh, have a lot of isopods, right? About how many species do you do you keep? Ooh, two fours. About twelve, I think. I have uh, just a shoebox of each species. I when I do a bioactive tank, I really like to just find out what species will thrive by just putting a couple different species in. And if one of them out competes, that's the one that should be in that tank. So you have like powder oranges and things that can kind of handle drier enclosure, including the Hoffman's eggy and bigger drier isopods. And then you've got, I have success with some of the arm, some of the armadillidium, armadillidium, boy, that's a hard one every time to in, and the uh, Porcelio will be in a wetter enclosure and do pretty well. And then there's always the dwarf purples that are under there doing the real work. But I'm definitely, Aquarimax is the, the isopod guy. I'm definitely doing the like, as long as I don't put two species that can interbreed together, I'll sometimes put armadillidium with the Porcelio and just see mm -hmm. which species in that setup overtakes the other. And then just as soon as I start, usually you'll see the difference in one of the groups won't have smaller babies. So most likely the other species is taking advantage of babies during molt. Um, so then I, I, I definitely separate and have original co cultures that are just one species, but I do like to kind of experiment just for the, the sake of the bioactive cultures that I'm setting up and to help suggest it to people. You sent me some isopods as well, didn't you? Yeah, I sent you some of the Hoffs. They were the, the, the giant yeah. gray Spanish. Cause I know you, with your, my, with your macro lens, I was like, he, and they're one of those species that's kind of cost prohibitive, but really amazing. So I was like, yeah, you you have the equipment to film this ice pod. So that's, that's the reason I sent you both. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, my, I've said it a thousand times. I'll probably say it a couple times on this podcast, but I just want more people to meet more bugs. And I saw your yeah, filming nice. technique and I saw that you don't just like film something and tell people that you know about it. You wait to have it. So I was like, well, if I send him a ghost now by next year, we'll get our ghost care video. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, uh, this, I, I've been in the pet hobby my whole life. I've been going to the pet stores with the babysitters just to, you know, be there and see what's in without needing to buy anything. And I've never heard of these species. This seems like it just out mm -hmm. of nowhere. I was like, wait, you can keep trap. What? Wow. <laughs> and I'd yeah. seen like illegal stick insects and things like that, that, you know, the small enough pet store that hadn't gotten caught yet. And so I'd seen that kind of stuff, but never the, the mantises. And now that the isopod hobbies exploding it's the same thing you you go up to people and you're like yeah you think you know what a roly-poly looks like uh, and then you open up this yeah. thing where there's clowns and zebras and dairy cows and bright orange and rubber duckies <laughs> it's just mind blown and you get that moment yeah. where you realize what you think you know about something could be improved and we can mm -hmm. go for it speaking of which um I know you tell everybody you want them back on, but if you can push for Patricia coming back on, I really liked that therapy session. <laughs> yeah, I was oh, getting yeah. I was getting free therapy back. too. I was just like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a fantastic podcast. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, I enjoyed talking to her. Um, you know, the, the isopods you sent me those those are probably the of all of them the species I have right now. Those are probably my favorite. Like mm -hmm. I really enjoy watching them and they are, they're breeding like crazy right now. Like there's probably yeah, two or three times the amount that you actually sent last time I checked. <laughs> and, and then I wasn't sure if they were like, initially they weren't breeding and I was kind of worried. And I reached out to Russ over at Aquarimax and was like, Hey, uh, what am I doing wrong? And he kind of, you know, gave me some tips and I followed his advice. And now there's, you know, five or six different sizes of them in there. And, I'm actually going to be moving them into a uh, a larger enclosure. Um, I'm just waiting for the enclosure to come in the mail. Uh, Tarantula Cribs is sending me a big enclosure for them, so I'm kind of excited to do that. So they're they're doing really well. So I just wanted to say thank you yeah. for sending no, those. Thank, again, thank you I, for I really thank appreciate you for showing them off. They're beautiful, and they just really again just put another dimension to Roly Poly, a potato bug. And yeah, they, th if I remember right, their husbandry is just a little drier than what you'd expect from an isopod. That's how I keep mine at least. And they definitely, yeah, I'll see them just the hovering thing, out so. away from anything moist. They're just like on their own cruising. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're supposed yeah. to be hiding under a log. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely are out. He, he told me uh, I needed more ventilation. Um, 
Yeah, because I it, even though I was kind of keeping them dry, it, there wasn't a, enough kind of air circulating to keep the air dry. So, you know, I like tripled the amount of holes that I had drilled in there, and then you know, it just the, the population is just exploding now. So it's it's funny and interesting how just small changes um, in habitat, you know, in the climate and and in, in, in in an enclosure wow that's difficult to say can uh, can really have a drastic change on you know wh- which species you have in there and it's not something that i Definitely. i think i noticed as much with like tarantulas and and snakes and stuff like that you know it's you you just do what you're supposed to do um and small changes don't really seem to affect them that much but isopods maybe because they're smaller uh, they're a lot more sensitive to to small changes and can make it break it. Well, and you're also dealing with your, you're judging whether they're doing well by how many more you're having. And like with a tarantula, if you were setting up for a breeding of a tarantula versus just keeping one in captivity, there's probably going to be a lot more nitpicking. I haven't dealt with breeding tarantulas yet, but yeah, definitely. If you, if you want them to just be there and themselves, they can survive a few things, but to set them up for success with breeding, you're going to need to be a little more nitpicky, which. Yeah. That's something Dustin was talking about when he was on the podcast, like uh, raising the humidity or the temperature or lowering the temperature, uh, the, the time of year. Like there's all kinds of the br- of brumating, br- things like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I thought that was yeah, kind definitely. of interesting. Well, and even just the care, like I just put the heater in the insect room and all of a sudden I'm doubling my spraying and having to double check everything because the, the humidity in the entire room is on its head. Which is another reason I yeah. hesitate to try to write care sheets because most of the time I say, well, what does the mantis need? Like, is it bowing down to drink because it needs more to drink? Or does it seem annoyed that you're spraying it all the time? Like, I don't know what your humidity is. I don't know what your ambient room temperature is. They're probably fine at room temperature unless you live at 50 degrees. Like, uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> and so, yeah it's, yeah, it's hard to write a care sheet for somebody when the exact same care sheet's probably not going to work when they turn their heat on in the winter. and. Yeah. Just being aware of that environment is part of it. Yeah. Like on my website and in my videos, or at least, you know, in, in most of them, I point that fact out. Like, I think I even had a whole video about how care sheets can be dangerous because, you know, what I'm doing is telling you how I keep them and I'm doing successful. And these, you know, I, I live in this part of the world and, you know, it, it, we're, I'm like uh, in a valley. So I got mountains on one side, but I'm also like, there's a creek like within Five, like a thousand feet from me, you know, and, and, and we, and that feeds into a river that's less than a mile away. So it's a little more humid here. I also keep them in a basement. So that also adds to the humidity and, uh, you know, it, it's cooler and more humid down here than it would be if I was keeping them, you know, upstairs or if I was like in a two or two story house or keeping them in an attic or something, it, it my husbandry would be different than it is uh, having them in the basement. Um, and, and I, like, I just had to move, I turned the heater on. Well, actually I, I had taken it out of the basement, so I had to move it back in, turn it on. Cause it was starting to, to dip uh, a little bit into the mid sixties at night. And, uh, like I got one of those, um, LCD kind of like thermometers that will tell me what the humidity is, what the temperature is, but it also tracks the, the high and the low. So I know what the warmest it's gotten in the room while I haven't been here and what the lowest is. So when I saw it kind of dipping below 68, I was like, all right, it's time to move the heater in. And as soon as you do that, you know, like, like you were mentioning, you notice the humidity all of a sudden starts taking a nosedive. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a, um, a cool water humidifier, you know, that I, uh, I, I set up down here because it, that helps my snakes a lot more than anything. Um, cause you know, they need a certain level of humidity to get a good molt. And I was noticing that last winter, um, they would be molting fine or not molting, shedding fine until, uh, the heaters really starts, it starts getting cold outside and I got that heater running a lot and then they were just having some bad sheds. So, you know, I, I invested in one of those humidifiers that just kind of turns on itself on and off based on what it kind of reads the temperature or the the humidity of the room. And that's, that's helped out my entire collection a lot. Yeah, for sure. So it's, 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 uh, it's one of those things that, you know, I can tell you what, how I do it, but you're going to have to take that information and maybe also pull from a few other reliable sources and then take all of that and adapt it to your situation, you know? And I think that's, I think more people should be, um, you know, saying that kind of stuff publicly, you know, cause it, there's, I don't want to say it's hero worship, but it, you know, there's, there is some kind of like people assume because you've got a camera pointed at you and you're talking about it, that you're some kind of authority and that everything you say should be taken literally and is the truth across the board. And, and, and I, like, I get frustrated when somebody's like, well, you shouldn't do it that way because Richard says to do it this way. And I'm like, well, no, Richard says, Richard <laughs> does, does it, it this that way. way. 
<laughs> yeah, other people can do it how what works best for them because you know my my method uh, is not universal. You know, it's it's just I'm just trying to share my experience mm-hmm. with you, not tell you what to do. Yeah, definitely. Well, and you mentioned it before, like a lot of care sheets that haven't engaged with the animals before, just look at the local temperature in the area where that animal's from. Like the whip spiders are from Tanzania, so they must love it super hot. And it's like, well, actually the animals can regulate and there's certain areas, pockets within caves or in termite mounds, I think is where they are usually found. And that stays regulated at like 70 degrees because it's underground, like a little hobbit hole. And so just looking at the weather in an area and being like, or the, you know, general climate and being like, well, this must be what they need. These animals are able to go up, down in the trees, underground, in logs and areas. Probably a lot of them have dipods and other like seasonal stop working kind of mechanisms so that they can survive climate shifts. And so, yeah, definitely there's an optimal temperature to keep your animals at. But if you have a power outage, there's some species that might be able to be just fine. So be sure to focus your heat packs or whatever else you have on the animals that are going to need it. And don't be like completely amazed that, yeah, I've had that problem. We had a power outage one of the Christmases and ended up coming home and everything had done great except one one pokey Metallica, the the light below him had been causing the air to circulate correctly, and that light didn't turn back on after the power outage, and I didn't notice. So I did. It's the only spider I've ever lost. Was my only lost tarantula, but but yeah, it's just the the rest. Everybody else did great with just that short moment of cold, and that's when I was just like, ghost manises. Everybody should have these. These are <laughs> amazingly hardy animals. But yeah. it's not something I wanted to experience. I definitely r- rushed home from northern Idaho. I-, I had a caretaker that was checking stuff, but, you know, you have so many thermostats going. I found out that one of my thermostat brands does not reset after a powder outage. The other ones do. Oh, I think I got that same one. Yeah, the one that's like $2 cheaper. <laughs> yeah. And now it's in the garbage can. But yeah, there's definitely, you know, you don't experience it until I've kind of now this summer we had some power outages just due to like high heat electricity concerns. And I was like, good, I get to test this out in the summer. What isn't going to turn back on and like get a plan going for next seasonal catastrophe. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I have, it's, I mean, I've probably got 12 different thermostats, um, just in my collection and one of them. And it looks very similar to all the other ones. But when the power goes off and comes back on, it, it just kind of like it's back to like 72 degrees or something like that. Something really low. And I can never remember which one it is. So I have to like check all of them every time. And then I get paranoid. I find it. I'm like, well, let me just double check all one. the other yeah. ones. Yeah, uh, I have that feeling. Yep. I, I finally, yeah. I wrote a big <laughs> note on to myself on the back of it and put it up in the like emergency animal stuff. Like if I need a thermostat because I need thermostat. to like set something up real quick, but not as like a regular thermostat i I should replace it i'm just kind of a cheapskate (laughs) yeah i like i said it's it's around still i just don't yeah and there was um one of my i guess it was my first tarantula ever uh i got it when i was 18 Mm -hmm. so i it was probably 10 years later i was um i was living in west virginia again and was going thinking about moving to daytona beach florida and this was like february uh and the the I guess my girlfriend at the time, we were living together. She had family down there. So we were going to go down there for a week and stay, look for an apartment, and just kind of like decide if that's where we wanted to move or not. And uh, while we were down there, something happened. And uh, I, I don't know what happened exactly, but the power was off for like when we came home, there was no power. Yeah. Uh, like uh, it was a crappy a garage apartment. And I think did something just it just tripped the breaker mm-hmm. or blew a fuse it was probably fuses that's how crappy the apartment was and um so i like i walked in i was like man it's really cold in here you could see your breath uh the the water in the toilet was frozen i was like oh no this is not good so i rushed to the tarantula and of course you know this was you know i was i mean it, it, i don't even know um what year this was probably 2005 ish maybe 2008 something like that uh maybe earlier and it was um uh, I, I just didn't know a lot about tarantulas so i actually had a heat rock in there uh oh. i don't even remember those things i don't even know if they sell them anymore it seems like nobody suggests using them for anything but 
there was a heat rock in there and the tarantula was essentially just trying to keep itself warm on the heat rock and that thing um just it that didn't work it wasn't producing enough heat to even so that was how my first tarantula died because i was out of town i didn't have anybody checking on it and the power went out and it just it, it got too cold for it um but it's yep. You know, it, it was heartbreaking, and you know, it was it was my mistake. I really should have had somebody checking in on the place, but I learned from that. So now, even if I'm like just leaving for the weekend, I get somebody to come by. Uh, you know, at least because I know you know they're going to be fine. You know, for a weekend, but at least check, make sure all the all the heat lights are on for the snakes, and and you know, the, everything's as it should be. And occasionally, it seems like um, I, I've talked about this before, but my. Uh, I guess it was this past summer. Um, my kid's grandma would come by and check on the dogs and the cats and, you know, everything like that. And a scorpion had gotten out <laughs> and she had to, a poor old lady had to, you know, capture that for me. <laughs> I felt really bad. It sounded like she handled it very well. <laughs> she did. Yeah. She is a trooper. She, she won't touch the snakes, but she has got no problem scooping up a scorpion. <laughs> that's yep that's everybody ha it's so weird that i don't know the the fear that people lock on to like the movement or the build of one thing like arachnophobes are fine with snakes and vice versa and you just it it's just that innate i mean i've always equated it i think i have all those like fear responses but it's like all of the happiness instead of fear which is interesting um, so it's, it's like, I, I, I get the same rush, but it's like a positive version of it, which I, I always, uh, explain as fascination through fear. Like you just still get that rush, but with, with out all of the negativity. Yeah. And a lot of times, the more you learn about something, the less scary it comes, uh, becomes, uh, cause I think a lot of my fear, at least with, with spiders initially was just, um, I, I didn't understand them. I didn't know anything about them. There was just a lot of the, of fear, of the unknown and worst case scenarios in my mind. And then the more I learned about it, the more I was like, these things are not nearly as bad as I thought they were, <laughs> you know? And, and that's actually kind of, I've been transitioning the past few days actually, um, with like, as far as like promoting a video or something like that, I've been kind of playing around with actually trying to get, a video in front of the eyes of somebody that identifies as an arachnophobe with mm -hmm. the, you know, like, Hey, I was arachnophobe. I was, you know, deathly afraid of spiders and this type of like exposure to them and learning about them helped me overcome that fear, you know? So maybe you should try that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> See yeah, how that goes. yeah. I, I, I use you as an example pretty often. I've met, I mean, I've a lot of people in the tarantula hobby seem to have that same story. Like the fear, kind of turned into like almost an obsession like once the fear was gone the interest was excessive which is great yeah I was just wondering uh you mentioned when you film you you feel like your tarantulas kind of wait for you to leave the room whether or not you've been waiting forever or not you know that they they'd molt if you weren't watching them kind of a thing but it, when I you know when I observe a tarantula molting he seems flipped and like he can't see in any way and engaging do you do you feel like your pre your tarantulas can tell your presence is there? Like you you spend a lot of time just kind of observing them. Do you feel like they can see you without sight? If that makes sense, do you think they can feel like determine your presence even when you're being really still? I've always wondered that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I think that they can tell when I walk into a room. You know, like um, I'll come down the because the way my basement's set up. You know, I come down these steps. Uh, and from the steps, I can like look out, like, especially the way I kind of rearranged everything. I can see everything behind me because the steps are like right over, wait, yeah, they're right over there. So the tarantulas are over here for people watching the video. Um, and I can see just like by coming down the steps and looking at them, a lot of them are out and they, they feel the, the movement of the air, um, you know, and, and they just take off and go run and hide. And yeah. yeah and, and when it's molting, um, I, I don't know if, if they, it, it may, it might just be bad luck, but it seems like I'll, I'll and it could also be the light. Cause if I'm, when I'm filming a tarantula molting, uh, a lot of the times I have to add additional light because the light that I have above their enclosure is just like a very dim led light. Um, sometimes like when you are looking at, you know, one of my videos, they kind of seem bright, but as far as, uh, your, your ability to record something on video, it's not nearly as bright it's you know it, it it's not bright enough to to get a good shot so i have to add additional lights like le like uh essentially like filming lights i'll put on top of the enclosure or outside the enclosure you know directed on the tarantula 
so that there's enough light to get a good image on the camera. And I think that that increase of light could also kind of set them, you know, on edge. So they just lay there and don't molt or, you know, don't feed or don't walk around or whatever it is that I want them to do so I can catch it on film. They just, all that additional light kind of freaks them out. And then, you know, whether I have to move the enclosure a little bit uh, or remove them from the enclosure, if I'm trying to get a video of them, like, you know, just walking around or something like, I think that also kind of puts them on edge and, and freaks them out a little bit. Um, but I, even in those situations where I set that stuff up and I'll sit there for a long time and not moving, you know, trying to be as still as possible, I think that they can still sense me. Um, and there's no scientific evidence or um, backing to this at all. It's just my opinion, uh, my feelings. Um, but I think even just me breathing, you know, just that small amount, even if I'm sitting perfectly still, just the inhale and exhale is creating enough movement of air molecules that they're, you know, possibly they're able to to sense that and know that there's, you know, that, that big weird guy with the red beard is watching me right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? You'd think they'd be used to it. <laughs> yeah. My dad, he was always a hunter and, you know, backwoods and he's very, he's an ER doctor, OB, you know, doctor minded person, very not hocus pocus, but he, when he was hunting, he feels like there's just that the eyes on the back of your neck example that, you know, everybody's kind of even culturally we've kind of talked about, but never really wondered. And so I, I kind of bring that into my mantis care. Like I'm, when I'm trying to pair two mantises, like I just, I feel like leaving the room is going to be the easiest way. Cause they're both kind of focused. And I've actually, when I was working with Amblypygi and I, I actually set up like a nanny cam and was just upstairs watching the nanny cam to make sure nothing bad happened because I just like you said even just the movement of air from breathing I feel like they're just so in tune to especially a species that has that kind of sensory organs but and, and another thing that I read it in the Amblypygi book by Oren but they supposedly Amblypygi uh, wait for their food to molt and I was like okay you know maybe they eat food that has molted in preference and so people see that and assume they were waiting but that seems like a little bit of extra effort like how how could an insect or an arthropod know that if it waits something will be better that just seems like a little bit of a jump to me and then I had that exact experience with one of my amblypygii I'd had a feeder in there for so long that I was like maybe I should take it out the amblypygii is not close to molting but like maybe it needs something new and then the next day the feeder had molted and the amblypygii was eating it the moment it had molted and it just blew my mind because I had totally read that and kind of discredited it as, you know, what, what are you talking about? And then it happened in my collection like a week later. So that, and and when you say <laughs> Amblypygi, <laughs> for those that aren't familiar with the scientific yeah. name, you're referring to tailless whip scorpion. Yeah, right? yeah, the tailless whip spider, Harry Potter spider, tailless whip scorpion, whip scorpion, all the, it's got a lot of names. I think Amblypygi is adorable. My favorite is the... <laughs> Taylor Swift's. Oh no, because <laughs> because people hear it wrong, or like their their text yeah. corrects them. It's like you yeah. must mean Taylor Swift. <laughs> <must mean> Taylor <laughs> yeah, they were one of the species that definitely started the ambassadorship. Like they're so nasty looking, and then when you meet one, you're like, oh, you are just the most scared. Want to be out of any danger? Like they they they'll pump a threat display if they need to. I, they'll, they'll, they'll do a threat display and pretend that they're the biggest thing in the world, but they're, they're looking for an out the whole time. And they're just, yeah, they're an amazing, if you, if you want a species like no other, there's some of the Florida whips that are really easy to care for. The, the diademe and the other, uh, Tanzanian species seem to be hit or miss cause they're all wild caught. And there's just those concerns. You can do the exact same thing with three animals and one will have parasitic issues from originally and things like that but really highly recommended as far as an animal to engage with yeah and determining what species you have can seems to be um difficult like i was sold a tailless whip scorpion and was told this is a tanzanian uh tailless whip scorpion i believe is um and it was you know i bought it from someone i don't know at a reptile show uh, i never really heard of them and they just they were the only ones that had any on their table and i was like this is my opportunity and i wanted to pay for shipping so i want to pick it up and i brought it home made a video about it. And it, during my research, um, you know, before I even made a video, you know, I'm like, I want to keep this for a while, make sure I'm doing it right. So I, I did all my research. I wasn't having, like it was thriving in its enclosure. 
Um, but I kept delaying making the video because I couldn't get a solid answer as to what species it was. You know, I, I'd reach out to yeah. some people that, I mean, I don't want to say they're self-proclaimed experts, but like, I felt like they would know a lot more about this species than I would. And I'd send them pictures and they would say, oh, this is definitely the species. Um, and then somebody else would be like, no, it's not that species. It's this species. And I was just going back and forth and was getting really frustrated. Uh, and finally I was like, I'm just, I'm going to make the video and, inevitably somebody's going to watch it. That's going to know more than me and they will the correct me. Tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and you know what, what's crazy is that that didn't happen. Like nobody has, like, a no. couple of people said it's not They're that species. There. And I'm like, well, what species is it then? Please help me. And they're like, Oh, I don't know. I just know it's not a D day Um, and then I saw Alex from tarantula Haven, Haven, ugh, tarantula Haven was having the same issue with his, uh, just trying to determine exactly what species, it is. Um, and it's one of those, you know, they're, they're not new to the hobby, but they're not nearly as popular as a lot of tarantulas and isopods and stuff like that. So I think as their popularity increases, there will be more people and more information available. Um, which is like, it's an, the exciting thing about kind of being in the invert hobby is that there's a lot of species out there that are just kind of like on the fringe that are gaining. And like the more you put that information out there or even just pictures and videos about them, more people get interested in them, more people end up adding them to their collection. There becomes more of a, a, a need for good information. And then that stuff, you know, it starts surfacing uh, in a way that's a lot easier to, to, to find, I guess. Yeah. And, and matching the experts with the hobby is, it seems like the gap right now. There's so much, so many entomologists that are total experts, but they don't engage in a way that the hobby can access that. Um, Definitely. Uh, one of the examples is just as simple as the mantis question, like snake discovery did a video and she's like, is it mantises or mantids? And Ed looks it up and he's like, oh, it's, it's both. And the mantis person I know is just like face palming because it's, it's mantids is a group is a genus within mantises. So all mantises, including ghost mantises, are mantises, but a certain group of mantises are mantids, if you ask an entomologist. But mm. everybody else is going to just say whatever comes to mind first, which is, you know, fine until the entomologists come nitpicking and they're like, that's not that species. That's not how you say that. I know with the whip spiders, it's like the difference between one or two tines on their, on their pedipalps. They've got like whether the tines are like this or like this kind of a thing is the difference in the species. I was sold. I bought a Tanzanian as it was marked and it came in, it was a Florida whip scorpion. So, which are about like an inch long. <laughs> and I, I contacted him and was like, I, you didn't send me what I ordered. And I, I bought a, I posted it getting excited because I was brand new to the hobby and somebody totally was just like, noob, what? No, that's not what that is. And <laughs> I got super embarrassed about that. And I still have one of the ones cause I had them, I was, I ordered four and I was like, can I keep one just as a like, sorry. And then they like used my photo that I took of the animals to prove what species it was on their website to sell it. And I called him. I was like, can you photo credit me or something? But it was just a really messy yeah, interaction. Yes. The whole thing was just like, uh, if you don't know what you're selling, just post a picture of it and let the buyer find out if you're not willing to do it yourself. But yeah, that was also my first like buying things online on the invert hobby. I was like, oh boy, this is going to be a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. hey, there, there's some, some, sellers out there that can be a little uh difficult to to work with i guess but that's something that um like a fr it's, i wouldn't say frustrate yeah i'll say frustration like because i really like taking photos and you know it, it I, I spend a lot of money on uh, lenses and cameras and lights and all that stuff and a lot of time i mean it, to get one photo um that i feel like is instagram worthy i guess you could say or that i'll, I'll post publicly I'd probably take a hundred photos. Maybe that might be an exaggeration, but I'll take a lot of photos and you kind of have to go through and find which one, uh, the lighting was good and the flash was working and, and lit up what I wanted, but wasn't overexposed or underexposed. And, uh, and then you edit the photos and Photoshop and stuff like that, try to bring out the shadows or, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of work that goes into a photo and then you post it. And then a week later you see some website has it up there for their care guide or trying to sell their species. And it's like, Hey, I spent a lot of time on that photo. Like, and technically it, it 
hosted and copyrighted, you know, I, I, you could at least give me some credit for it. Um, and that's actually something I've been looking at because it's, it's really hard to kind of monetize that, um, or, you know, to, to get people to even give you credit, let alone pay for it. So like I've been actually looking at, um, posting a lot of, or like licensing them through, uh, my photos through like Shutterstock or, uh, Getty Images and places like that where, it's they'll they'll pretty much handle it you know what i mean like the, you got to pay them and, and you only get a percentage of it but at least it'd be some kind of income to kind of um essentially and, and not even like a profit it would just be offsetting the expense of all these cameras and yeah, stuff i mean just being given the credit to take all that time to get those photos is is in itself just respectful i d- <laughs> i had one of the funniest examples of this uh somebody on ebay wanted to trade with me they wanted so some mantises and so they're like oh just look at my collection see what you want we can trade something and i looked and they were using my hoffman zaggy isopod photo from my instagram that's not arthropods ambassadors i have a quail in the city as well that has some stuff so they had stolen my photo and then asked me to trade insects not knowing it was me and so i was like well first of all, <laughs> well, first of all I don't even know if you have these animals because you're using my photos. And I never heard back from them. They were very embarrassed. <laughs> Just <laughs> went into the wood grain. But yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've done that myself. Like I um, was making a, it was a post about the, um, one, it was some huntsman spider that I had, I had received. And I just had a very tiny sling and I just did a quick Google search and pulled up a picture of what it looked like full grown. Uh, and it wasn't like I was, I wasn't trying to sell it or, uh, promote a video or anything like that. It was just kind of a, uh, I just got this spider in, here's what it looks like as, you know, a very young kind of spiderling. This is, and this is what it will look like when it's older. And it was just like a paragraph about some information about like just an interesting fact about the spider, um, and posted it. And then whoever took that picture sent me an email and they were, they were very rude and very upset that I was using their, their photo and, you know, I'm sensitive to that. So I actually like did some research when I was like, I'm going to use this photo and like reverse searched it through Google images, trying to find, um, who actually took the photo. And it was like all over Pinterest and Facebook and Reddit. And you know what I mean? There was like the photo had been used, you know, probably almost a hundred times, no watermark. And I couldn't determine, uh, who the original photographer was. So I ended up, I was like, all right, well, I feel like I've done my due diligence. It wasn't, and I spent, you know, 15 minutes trying to discover who this person is and I didn't. So I am giving up and just want to post it because uh, apparently they don't care. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I was gentle. I was like, just a photo credit. I didn't get too upset. I was like, hey. And then they got weird about like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, well, if you don't know how to photo credit, you probably shouldn't be running a website. But yeah, I tried. I mean, you know, trying to yeah. look from their point of view, who knows where they got it from and both times i was like by the way that is mine and then they just kind of ghost just like oh no <laughs> yeah i think a lot of times people just assume like it's on the internet it's a photo i'm just going to use it like it, it doesn't hurt anybody um you know and, and it doesn't it's not that it, it hurts anybody i guess it, but it is a little frustrating when you're the person that's been a lot of, i mean it's kind of like artwork or something you know you spend a lot of time getting that um, but I think some people just don't know how to get good pictures, especially if they don't have a camera and they're just using their phone. Sometimes it can be very difficult to get a picture of a tarantula or even more so like a mantis or an isopod. So you just, you're like, well, I know I have that species. So I find a picture of it and just use it. Uh, and, and it doesn't even cross their mind that, that somebody took that picture <laughs> and, and it's a small hobby. So it's probably somebody you're going to be interacting yeah, with. Yeah. You know, and I apologize to the guy. I was like, look, I'm sorry. I tried to find out who you were. Um, and, and I was, it wasn't readily available. So, uh, you know, I, I'll be more than happy to give you credit. Uh, just give me your information. Um, and in that case, though, just their response, like they were just kind of, I, don't, I mean, I don't want to use profanity, but You're huffy. They, they were a jerk. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, you know what? Screw the whole thing. I'm just going to delete the posts everywhere. And, and you know, I, I would have been more than happy to give you credit, but you were kind of a, a jerk about it, even after I explained where I was coming from. Like I wasn't, and their big thing was like, you're using it to, uh, to make money. And I'm like, no, like Facebook posts are not monetized. Reddit posts are not monetized. Like I didn't make a video on it. I'm not selling them. Like there, there's, there was no money exchange there. So like, I, I don't, I don't understand where you're coming from with that accusation. Yeah. 
Um, but so I just deleted the whole thing. It seems like when people are mad, they're arguing with you about what they think you did and they don't want to actually hear the other side of the conversation. It's pretty common currently to just, yeah, argue with what you think somebody's about to say, and it's not going to engage the conversation in a way that you'll grow in any way. And it's just going to attack them to shut down. But yeah. And I, I, I love the art I've gotten and it's some, some of it's in my art, in my bug room. And when I'm filming, it's like, do I avoid it or do I give it credit in some way? Like I have one of the Tetraceras does some really adorable art for um, tarantulas and really brings to life, like how adorable they are. And so every time I swing by, it's like, should I mention that artwork or should I just like scoot the camera up and over <laughs> just to be able to give everybody the credit they need? One thing we were talking about before we started uh, recording the podcast, um, it's it's a, a aspect of the hobby that I've kind of been struggling with. Um, like I got some two different species of assassin bugs and uh, one of them's seemingly pretty successful. The other one is struggling. And, you know, I, I was told when I got them, um, and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus cause I don't think they were like intentionally giving me bad information or anything. Cause I heard it actually from multiple sources, people were like, these, these are uh, pretty easy to take care of and they're prolific breeders. So, you know, you get like a small starter colony of like five or six, um, within a year, you're going to, you're going to be trying to give them away <laughs> if not sell them because you're going to have so many of them. And I have not had any, I haven't had any luck really with breeding with them, like just breeding. Um, so do you keep assassin bugs? And if so, uh, can you share some of your experience, please? Yeah, I we ended up with the assassin bugs at one of the shows, and I'm I think they're very underrated. They're amazing. They're very focused, sight based pr uh, predator, so they're just really interesting to watch and engage. And they're really good in a communal. And I have always found that fascinating. Something is so brutish and aggressive towards its prey, just being able to interact with another thing like it so well. So I love the assassins for that. But yeah, we have the assassins, and we love them. They the white spots seem to be the easiest to care for. That's what we're overrun with. And I currently just keep them in a two gallon fish tank. I have all of their runoff colony or in another enclosure. And there's two adults that live just under this cork bark. But this, I feel like the success comes with a little, a little bit of ignoring them. And so I, I allow them to dry out and then get moist again. I've noticed there've been like issues with mold on the egg capsules themselves. So even if they're breeding, their egg capsules aren't working. And if you look in the hobby, definitely the, the horrid Kings are super expensive, which always suggests to me that there might be a trick or two that keep them a little bit more rare. But, and so I've been having problems with my horrid Kings as well. I've got a lot of eggs coming now, but it was after I set them up kind of like I do my roaches. And so I have them on in a large enclosure, with a heat strip under one side so that they can thermoregulate and then kind of moist on the other side. I feel like they're a little more tropical than the two spot. Um, but yeah, they're, I've definitely been getting a lot of little ones. And like I said, they're just such an engaging species that's so different from any of the tarantulas or any of the mantises in a way that I've, I think that they're a great ambassador. Uh, I haven't been bit yet and I've heard horror stories, so I'm avoiding it at all costs. I've heard that they're one of the rethink keeping inverts sort of bites. So I definitely <laughs> wouldn't suggest cuddling with them, but as far as watching their interaction, they're amazing. But yeah, I, I definitely, I missed once or twice a week, but allow it to dry in between sessions. They will kind of extend their proboscis and drink. I love telling people technically they are the only bug in my collection. So bugs are a group of insects that have the sucking mouth pieces and a couple other, um, order things. So any aphids and a lot of the stink bugs and a lot of assassins and things like that are the only thing that actually qualify as bugs if you ask an entomologist. So I've got a lot of insects. I've got a lot of arthropods. I don't have very many bugs. <laughs> but then <laughs> bugs is also the umbrella term most people use. So bugs in cyberspace, things like that. But yeah, yeah. The, the assassins are great. I find that it's they seem to attract a group of people that when you're at an expo, it, there seems like uh, like frat esque younger male men really like the assassins. I've always and I've I've got a few friends that are, you know, college techie nerds that have a assassin on their desk and absolutely love it. Whereas they wouldn't think twice about owning any of the other species. And I'm currently not really sure on their lifespan. These guys are at like two and a half years and ticking, and I've been told they shouldn't live that long. So we're 
figuring that out before we mm. do the care sheet, like always. <laughs> yeah. And mine are at um, one year now, almost exact. Well, I, they, they were obviously alive before I got them because some of them, I, I got a, a mixture of, I think there were a few adults and then some juveniles um, and I, maybe, you know, like a few nymphs. Um, and, and they've been like my white spotted ones. They're, they're thriving. Like, <laughs> I think all of them are still doing well. Maybe, maybe lost one. Um, but I haven't had any babies yet, which is kind of frustrating for me because I was really wanting to uh, grow the, the colony. My uh, horrid kings have just kind of slowly been dying off. Uh, I'm down to two. I think I had five originally, four or five, something like that. Um, so if, if you end up having some successful uh, eggs hatch and you decide you want to sell some, definitely keep me in mind. I, I, I would like to pick some up. I actually have some of the horrid king eggs because I'm trying a couple. When I'm not having success, I just split stuff around and try a couple different things. And so one of the things I'm trying is – at the bottom in the cocoa fiber in the enclosure that I'm incubating the orchid, uh, orchid mantis ooths. And so they're in with some springtails to keep the mold contained a little bit higher heat and high humidity. And then there's some that I'm leaving just with the adults. There's another enclosure that I'm not getting as humid as often. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's such a, the hobby is so small that we kind of have to be citizen scientists and split up our, ways i think but are you are you seeing yeah. the little tiny egg capsules in the white spots yet because they do take a little while to hatch no not that i've noticed i'll, I'll have to go look after the podcast um okay. yeah i haven't seen anything while i've been in there that looked like eggs um and and definitely no you know nymphs or you know anything very small moving around uh which is why i've been frozen because I, I i thought i had talked to somebody else and they're like well you know maybe the substrate is too moist and so you know but i'm like i don't even see eggs <laughs> but you know I, i'm not an expert that's why i haven't made a video on those guys yet because it's like i, I want to have at least some successful eggs hatch so i know like all right so I, I must be giving them at least good enough environment that they're able to breed successfully mm -hmm. Um, so until that happens, you know, I'm just, I'll take pictures of them, but that's about it. We'll wait for the husbandry video until uh, I, I've figured out exactly how to do that. Yeah. You might try to flush them with the food too. Just throw in a bunch of red or whatever feeders you use. Um, and I know the crickets can be dangerous during a molt, but if you're in a colony like that, it, if one isn't picked up by one, it'll be picked up by the other. So it's not quite as much of a concern. So maybe like throw in enough feeders that they're not finished by the next day and then pull stuff out and just make sure that they're overfed. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I make sure with the, any of my communals that there's plenty mm -hmm. of food, whether they're scorpions, tarantulas, or, or you know, the assassin bugs. Yeah. Uh, one of the yeah. cool things with the assassin bugs that I've noticed is that sometimes they'll they'll share food or, you know, like they'll each have one end of a cricket or a roach. <laughs> and occasionally they'll like fight over it, but they don't harm each other while they're fighting over it. They just kind of wrestle back and forth and one walks off with the cricket uh, while yeah. the other one goes hunting for prey again. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of my favorite things about them. And I have, I'm one of the people on the M. Balfouri communal list. And that's my obsession with them is watching tarantulas like have a conversation about who wins. They just like, they'll like elevate over each other and be like, yeah, they're, yeah, very democratic for a tarantula. <laughs> <laughs> Communals are fascinating. And, and it's one of my favorite. I think that's why I kind of expanded outside of tarantulas is um, I knew that. In Balfouri was about the only one people have had um, consistent success with. Like there's some other species people have kept communally, um, but the when you move beyond in Balfouri, the success rate seems to to drop drastically. Like some some people keep P. metallicas communally with no issues, and then other people end up with one really fat spider. So, you know, it's yeah. one of those things that I know that there are some species of scorpions that just in the wild or live communally. So that's what it's kind of what got me into scorpions initially is I wanted to have another communal in my collection. And uh, I went with the Florida bark scorpions and there's some other species, but I, I try to stay away from uh, tr scorpions that are like super hot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I don't want like anything that's way too venomous. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, communals are very interesting. Uh, and I wish, you know, there were, there were more species that, you know, had that kind of communal capability. But I think that's also why I got really into bioactives because I, I like the fact that you could have springtails and isopods and be living with tarantulas or scorpions or, you know, some other kind of uh, invert or reptile. Yeah. I, I mean, my, my first tarantulas, I started on the deep end. I did the thing you're not supposed to do. And I was at a, I was at a show and I had P. metallicas on my maybe list if I ever thought about getting tarantulas 
and the guy had them and he was keeping the slings communally. And so I was like, do you have any P Metallica? And he turns around this enclosure and they're all cuddling together. And my like heart just was like, oh, you that's the cutest thing. <laughs> and so I got three of those because that's all I could afford. <laughs> and I had them together for a while. And one of them just seemed to be on the other side of the cage, not engaging with the others. And so I took that one out thinking, you know, if you're not engaging, maybe you're being chased away. But the other two are still in their enclosure. They're in a 10 gallon above me. And the male matured a while ago, and he's my little cricket. He's drumming all night long. And the female just molted to probably maturity. And he's a, he's really annoying with her. And I've been trying to, like, tong feed her because she's still post-molt skinny, and he's putting himself in danger every day. <laughs> and I should separate him if I, I would suggest separating to another person. But she's been doing good with him, and I've been able to get her eat, to eat a roach or two, so I'm not quite as worried and it seems to me, I did a lot of research on it, and it seems like the split between whether or not you can keep them communally seems to be whether or not you're in the U.S. or the U.K. <laughs> I think that they're cheaper and more common there in a way that people have taken that risk. And here it's just not worth dropping that money and hoping. So that That's seems like point. what I saw when I saw people really adamant both ways. It's like, well, are you from the U.S. or are you from the U.K.? <laughs> Not that you should yeah. put animals in danger, <laughs> but it sounds like it works, except every once in a while, but that every once in a while isn't worth it when it's $90 a spider. Very true. And that's one of the um, downfalls um, or blind spots, I think, in our hobby is that people are very uh, eager to share their successes and um, very reluctant to share failures. So somebody will try it out and it not work, and then they just never mention it again because they don't want to be the person that admits that I lost half of my collection uh, or half the communal um, from cannibalism or, or worse. Uh, but if somebody is successful, then, you know, it, they're making videos and posts and, you know, sharing pictures like nonstop. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, it's, it's, it's not an accurate representation of reality. And people begin to think, well, you know, this species must be communal because all I'm seeing is success stories. And it's like, well, it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's, um, has the highest or the, the success rate that you think it does. Cause mm -hmm. A lot of people out there are uh, losing tarantulas to cannibalism or, you know, whatever species of invert they got. They're just not telling you about it. Well, and just allowing that tarantula to tell you, like, like I said, I was observing the communal and one of them did not seem to be part of it. So I removed him and I've, I've seen a pokey Pisolotheria breeding video where the male was definitely like, let me out of this enclosure. What are you doing? And the, the owner was like, eh, we'll see what happens in the morning. <laughs> and it was dead in the morning. But I like just knowing body language and seeing that male tarantula who are usually very annoying being like, please, please let me out. I was like, maybe, yeah, I would have, I would have made a different decision. And that's definitely an example of what can happen. But yeah, I, I think that the, the hobby should definitely be a safer space for people to explain their negative situations just so that we can all learn. Cause that's going to be the most positive in the future. I agree a hundred percent. And it's, it's, it's a shame that, you know, you can't be, uh, cause it's a lot of this is new, you know, like, uh, people haven't been keeping tarantulas and stuff like that for hundreds of years as pets, you know, like maybe dogs or cats or something like that, thousands of years. Uh, so there needs to be some room for experimentation in my opinion. You know, like I set up this, uh, paludarium bioactive enclosure for, um, uh, a Caribbean of Versicolor and, you know, it's, not a traditional enclosure, uh, you know, it's got like a fish tank in the bottom, essentially. And I got a beta living and then like a small area of, you know, I made a whole video on it. And I honestly expected to get a, a lot harsher criticism than I did. I, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm doing this and people are going to lose their minds because it's not a traditional enclosure for this species. So I was like ready for a lot of backlash uh, for whatever reason, maybe just didn't get on the right people's radar. <laughs> people have already unfollowed me or something. So uh, I, I didn't get the negative comments I was kind of anticipating, but it's like, I wanted to try it out. Um, you know, I wanted, cause I, I had seen some people post, um, pictures and, you know, kind of just discussions about uh, different ways of, of keeping avicularias and carabinas. And, and they were essentially what they did is like, they used a really large water dish or they didn't have any substrate at all. And they just like had a couple of inches of water in the bottom of the enclosure because, you know, the tarantula just didn't really go down to the, the floor of the enclosure very often. And, and they got ridiculed. And I was like, you know, 
maybe they are on to something though. Like, uh, you know, we, we won't find the best way, uh, to keep something if we don't do a, some experiment. And I'm not saying like something like way out of, on, uh, you know, and way out of left field, but kind of like, uh, you know, just trying something new. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, admit that it didn't work and why it didn't work and, and go back to what is proven. Uh, but if you, if we all just get set in our ways and into that rut, then, you know, it's, we're not going to grow as keepers or, you know, in a, in the hobby, you know, sometimes you got to do a little of experimentation or a little bit of alteration, um, and, and see if it works, if it works. Like so far, uh, th- th- it's been working out well. Like the tarantula seems it's, she's eating, uh, she's making herself at home. Things are going well. And, uh, you know, but it, the first sign of some issues, like if it's just too humid in there or it just doesn't seem like it's comfortable, um, you know, or it's health is deteriorating, then I will definitely take it out, put it into more, um, traditional type of enclosure. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I, I wanted to try it out. Cause I thought it would be a kind of cool biodiverse enclosure where, you know, it's, it's from, you know, a kind of a, a humid tropical area. That's the environment that's inside here. But I also wanted to make sure to give it that ability to escape the heat or the humidity, you know, um, like it would in the wild. Yeah. And definitely with the bioactive tanks, it's kind of getting into fish culture sort of concerns where you need things to cycle. So you need your, you don't just need to add springtails, but you need them to be a springtail population that has been dealing with mold in a way that they're ready for it. So a lot of cycling things that aquaculture takes into concern starts needing to be taken into concern with bioactive cultures. So setting up a tank that is ready for a concern instead of, and that kind of stuff needs to be looked into more. So you you could say, yeah, I set up this tank and it didn't work, but is it because just needed 10, 20% more springtails so that something didn't bloom or things like that. So I feel like, yeah, even there's so many differences in how those tanks can go that saying whether or not it worked is definitely not definitive, like keep working on it. But if you can keep dart frogs and stuff like fancy stuff like that, I feel like there's ways to keep fungal issues down. So which, which dart frogs are surprisingly easy and fun if, like I said, this tank is cycling correctly. Yeah, I had, uh, I, I was concerned. Like, I didn't want to just, like, rush into this and it um, become a failure. And then, like, that be on video and people just assume, okay, this isn't going to work at all because Richard wasn't able to do it. So, I, uh, I essentially, and, and I think it frustrated, um, like, a, it wasn't it weren't really a sponsor of the video, but ZooMed had sent me some stuff uh, to use in the enclosure. Uh, and, and, you know, when, when they do something like that, they, they want to make sure that you're actually using the stuff and wanted a video to, so the, the guy that sent it to me could show his boss, like, and, and justify, uh, sending me, you know, some free cork bark and whatever it was they, um, they sent a tank heater and like a water heater and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I was, I, he was like, where's the video? And I'm like, well, it's going to be <laughs> like a few more weeks, man. Cause like, I'm doing this very slowly. I'm setting up the enclosure. Uh, get filling up the water, getting that. You know, I want to make sure before I even put the betta fish or any kind of living animal in the water that, you know, the levels had kind of uh, like, you know, hit their optimal. Um, I just want to make sure everything was was perfect. And then I moved the fish in, yeah. you know, and then once that's stabilized, uh, then we'll work on the plants and, and get that going. And once the plants have rooted and are growing and they're not going to die within a week or two, um, once they're established, then we'll, you know, it was, it was steps. And I was like, this is going to be like six, eight weeks, you know, you just got to be patient with me. I, I want to make sure I do it right. Um, you know, so I moved in isopods and springtails and, and let them kind of get established and, and make sure, you know, and I, the whole time I'm checking humidity levels and temperature levels. And it, it just was like an, an empty enclosure that was slowly being built over weeks. And then when I was comfortable that everything had, it was, was stabilized and, you know, it was consistent, you know, the, the humidity was within an acceptable range and stuff like that. Then it's like, all right, now, now we'll move in the tarantula and, you know, and, and go from there. And, and I told people when I put out the video, like, if this doesn't work, I'm going to definitely be the one to tell you, cause I don't want somebody watching this video and then and making the same mistake I did, you know, and you know, there needs to be more of that out there. I, occasionally you see somebody that will try a communal with like, um, uh, what was it? Neotheli NC. Uh, there was a lot of people that were like, this is a communal species of tarantula. And then in, in, uh, it ended up not being, cause <laughs> they went from like 10 tarantulas to three tarantulas really quick. Uh, you know, and other people have had success. Like I'm not, uh, I wouldn't keep them communally. I don't keep them communally, but I, I know some people have had varying rates of success with them. Um, but you know, it's one of those things that we got to, 
Yeah, we got we got to share our successes and our failures equally. Uh, that's the only way that we'll learn and grow as a hobby. Mm-hmm. And that's how I feel about the ghost manises. They're they're everywhere plastered online says communal, communal, communal. And I do keep large groups together, well fed, and they do pretty well. But once they're adult females, they are as mantis as mantis gets. They want to eat everything that moves. And so everything you see online for the care is they're a great communal species. And I've definitely, if you have enough of them to not mind a loss, a lot of cannibals I see start, um, two mantises will lock onto the same feeder and they will just start eating and whoever makes it to the other mantis first wins. So yeah, it's, you'll definitely find communals that there's mess ups that people are, I've, the cats have been the best by far. These guys are just fantastic at, at communal. I've really been impressed. But most communal mantises, just it just means they prefer smaller prey. It doesn't mean they like hanging out together, whereas the Balfouris are actually interacting in a social capacity. So I would call that communal, and then the other one would be more like can house together, but they might not. Yeah. They're not so, so much communal as they are tolerant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They'd, they'd prefer something smaller to eat, but, you know, when when they need something to eat, they're going to find something to eat. They're, they're still able to navigate their reality. But So you've yeah. got a uh, YouTube channel yeah. where you um you discuss a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today. Um, you have, like, care videos or uh, what, it, what kind of content can people expect to find on your channel? I'm mostly, I've been comparing different species mantis as I have them. As I mentioned, I, I feel like my care on ghosts is pretty dialed in, but I haven't really made, I've been, a, been asked about making cat care videos, but as far as I've gotten is just, this is where I'm keeping them. I, my YouTube is very looking at the animal the entire time and not very much of me talking. And a lot of times it's just bringing something out to see how it moves. Cause when I started looking into YouTube, that's what I kind of wanted was just, I want to see how this animal moves and how this animal interacts to being handled. And beyond that, like I can look up what you're talking about sort of thing. So they're very short videos, um, work every, every video. I learned something new about editing and then I just, yeah, I have my hands in there handling the insects. I'll compare like I, one of my last ones was communal mantises. So I say, you know, this is a ghost mantis. Sometimes they don't work very well as communals. These are cryptic mantises. They work a lot better. And then these are cat mantises. These are my favorite as a communal from what I've experienced. Um, so just a lot of the like quick, quick topics under five minutes, just get that idea out into the world so that people can learn before they engage fully by getting one of those animals. Um, and then I also, I just use my hands. I, I, I have like one video with my face in it. Um, cause I kind of wanted to avoid just all the extra comments about me. I just want to talk about the animals. And even that has been unavoidable because I used to be working on a farm that I had these calluses and these dirt that just was fused into my skin. And so, you know, 30% of the comments are like, what's wrong with your hands? It's like, I was trying to avoid this by not having my face and it's still, people can't help themselves. So, (laughs) but yeah, that's most of my YouTube. Yeah, that, that's that's the internet though. People like making comments that have nothing to do with the video. <laughs> like, there's I get some strange comments as well, but I think it's a little different because I'm a guy. Like, I've noticed it seems females get a lot more uh, critical comments on YouTube about appearance than guys do. Like, I I get comments about my beard. That's about it. <laughs> so uh, I feel for you. Um, and and I I had the same issue. Like, I my day job uh, I work a lot with precious metals and one of the things that you would have to do to test if something is gold or gold plated or brass or whatever is, is use nitric acid. And so I have to drip nitric acid on, um, different metals throughout the day. And inevitably some of it gets on the tips of my fingers and it burns like crazy. Um, but you know, you can rinse it off or, or use a neutralizer to, to get rid of that, but it stains your fingers, this like bright yellow color. And I get really, self-conscious sometimes when I'm making a video and I have my hands in it somewhere and you can just see like my, like a portion of my nail and then like the tip of my finger is this like, I mean, it's like jaundice looking. It just, (laughs) it doesn't look natural. It's, it's almost disgusting. I'm like, Oh, I got to cut that out because I don't want people thinking I'm like uh, starting to rot or something like that. Cause it's, you know, it's, it's disturbing looking. Like my, my wife thinks sometimes it looks like nicotine stain. She's like, you've been smoking cigarettes. I'm like, no, it's just, it's nitric acid. (laughs) It's, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be on the middle of my middle fingers, like on the fingernail. <laughs> if it was, if it was cigarettes, it would be like on the edges, but yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Uh, and just, just the whole online culture sometimes, the comments people leave can. Well, and just being in their head, 
Like they, they, all they can see is a dirty hands. They just, they can't see the animal because they're just so distracted by normally seeing hands that are in advertisements or something, or they work on a computer all day. So they don't have dirt under their fingernails from digging potatoes. So and I, you know, I want to understand them and engage positively and be like, thank you for your concern. I did wash my hands. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, really, can't you just, it's a pretty mantis. Look at the mantis. I'm, I'm literally showing you bugs. You don't think I might have some dirt under my fingernails. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a cooking show. <laughs> so you also have a pretty big, you said like Instagram is your, your main focus or, I mean, would, would you describe it that way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my first, I really didn't, I tried to stay off most, uh, most social networking stuff. And then I was in a environmental class where they asked us to do an Instagram account from the view of an animal. And so my first Instagram was quail in the city. And it was just like, what do animals see as their reality? And then I just kind of turned that into my personal account. And then that extended into the, uh, arthropod ambassadors account, because I just want people to see the animals just up close macros, as well as just what it's like to keep them and them in a you know, pretty settings just to make them more appealing. So a lot of it, a lot of what I do is Instagram, um, really nice community shapes of nature and Tetraceris and mantidology all are just kind of, they're some of my best friends are on my Instagram account. So, but Very it's, cool. it's just really fun to share that community and get that, that focus on just the photos and not so much negative comments that sometimes filter their way into the conversation and Facebook and things like that. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm wanting to, talk to the guy from shapes and nature and get him on the podcast as well. Cause I've, I've sat in on a few of his uh, live streams on Instagram. Uh, I know he's friends with uh, Peter from bugs and spiders, cyberspace, it's just kind of like you guys have like your own little click, kind of like how tarantula people have their <laughs> click and true. scorpion people have their click. So it's like, I really want to kind of cross that bridge, get him on there. Uh, I still need to reach out to him, I think, and, and try to make it official. But if you're listening by any chance, uh, you're more than welcome to come on the podcast. Oh, yeah, Je Jesse's <laughs> more than down. I'm actually wearing one of his shirts right now. He's got the I'd rather be bug hunting shirt. Give a shout out. And those are a bunch of his designs. <laughs> so he's done a single stickers. And so his single stickers designs yeah. sit onto a shirt. But he he yeah. used a lot of the I sent him a bunch of photos of ghost manises for his ghost manis sticker. I took one photo and he like Great messaged cool. me. He's like, can you get it at a little different angle? I was like, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> And I actually sent him a spiny flower mantis so that he'll do that sticker. So I'm locking him down on it. He needs to make that sticker for me. Very cool. I actually have one of his stickers on my desk right here. It's a uh, Taylor's. Yeah, book. the Ambo Pikey, the best. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I don't know where I'm gonna. St I, I I keep getting his stickers. People keep sending them to me. Um, I think it's mainly bugs in cyberspace. Every time I get a package from him, he yeah. throws some of his stickers in, yeah. and they're really cool. And I don't want to just like put them, I want to put them somewhere special, you know, that I want to see them and appreciate them. And they're not going to get destroyed. And that's just ended up uh, like, I haven't stuck them anywhere yet. They're <laughs> just piling up on my desk. And all of mine are, I, gotta I treat out. them like collector cards. I have them all as cards in a thing. I haven't been able to stick them to anything, but <laughs> nice. <laughs> and he's also, he just, he focuses on conservation. A lot of, he does a lot of actual animals, not insects. And then puts money towards i i know when when australia was having issues with wildfires he did a australia series and then all the profits went to australian wildlife saving so he's really active in conservation and conservation that's like smaller concentrated efforts so condor research and things like that so he's he's really got a great yeah. ethic going forward so if people want to check out your uh, youtube channel it's just arthropod ambassadors as well as your um uh, Instagram, like everything, your website is arthropod, uh, dash ambassadors. Is that right? Yeah. It was that thing where one, some things take dashes, something take dots, like the email is a dot and the other one's a dash. It's, it's whatever the format took. So you can't do underscores in a website name. So you can't do that, but the underscore works for Instagram names and that ended up being the yeah messiest yeah. thing about it. But for some reason, it's but it's a name reason, that hasn't been used anywhere else. So I been used anywhere got else, all the domains and all that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was having issues with that because um, it, it was the well. First, it was just Tarantula Collective, but there's a um, oh man, I don't even know how to like some kind of electronic music. I don't, it's not dubstep. It's more like house or something like that out of Brazil and the, or something somewhere in South America uh, oh, called really? the Tarantula Collective oh, really? or just called Tarantula Collective. <laughs> So when I started the YouTube channel, they already had it. 
and they were much larger than me. So I was like, well, I, I want to differentiate myself from them. So it'll just be the tarantula collective. Uh, and then when I, you know, it, then it, it, it turns out that within a year, my channel was bigger than theirs and they weren't even like, I don't even know if they're still together. <laughs> I haven't seen any, uh, anything new out of them for a while. Uh, but at the time when I started, they had all of the domain, you know what I mean? Like everything was uh, that I wanted, they already had. So, and I was struggling because like, I couldn't just have the tarantula collective without the underscores on Instagram. So I was like, well, you know, I tried to keep everything the same and it, it just depending on what platform you're on, they will accept spaces or they won't accept spaces or they will take an underscore, but you know, there's, you can't use it. So I was like, there's no way to kind of make this universal, <laughs> which is kind of frustrating. So I, I feel where you're coming from. Um, but if people want to, you know, check out your website, you've got some stuff, uh, like, uh, what kind of stuff is on your website? People, if, I mean, can they I buy? I mean, currently it's just the Mantis care sheet that's focused on ghosts and then my, my availability list that I try to keep updated. Uh, I need to do more pages. I'm actually building the website from script. So I'm not using a hosting. I should be using a Squarespace and not wasting so much time, but we're, we're hosting it through the, the tech side of my relationship has it all on lockdown. So learning and it's, it's really, I kind of enjoy coding. It's, 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 it's a sick pleasure of mine. I like, I like to be in pain and stuck up against walls and unable to do stuff. And then as soon as you break free, it's like, oh, I can make this text larger. And then you see another website and you're like, Oh, that was so hard for them to do, even though they probably just used a <laughs> platform. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I started that with, uh, my website was just, uh, I was using WordPress and, um, like .org or whatever. We actually have to code it yourself. And, uh, was overwhelmed, but I had a friend that was, uh, that he was very, that was, he was actually trying to start a business, um, developing websites a few years ago. So he was pretty much was like, I will help you do this. Essentially what he, what essentially meant I'll do this for you, but I got to be able to use it like in my portfolio, uh, to show other people, well, this is what I can do so I can sell my services to them. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. Uh, he worked on it for about six months and, um, I started getting other jobs that were paying. So like, uh, the priority <laughs> for my website kept moving further and further down his list. So I was like, well, I got to learn to do this myself and spent like three months trying to figure out what he was doing and finally got so frustrated. I was like, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm taking the whole thing down. And uh, I just went to Squarespace <laughs> and took the easy route. Especially when you're coding off somebody else's code. Like if, if yeah. he's written it, yeah. you're trying to tweak it versus having written it yourself is... Yeah, very difficult. <laughs> and and I don't I don't speak that language. <laughs> I mean, I think a friend of mine his his kid is um got three, two or I oh, know he's four. Jeez, I'm getting old. He's four now, and they're talking about what language because uh, his wife is Russian, so the kids learn in Russian and English at the same time. And you know, it's I wish somebody was teaching me that language, but he's like, I don't want him to learn Spanish or Russian. I want him to learn code because that's a universal language. So he's like starting to teach his kid at four years old, how to, how to do, you know, coding, which I think is, is pretty cool. Yeah. The future is going to be different. <laughs> and at least, well, I wanted to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been uh, very interesting talking to you and it's nice to get to meet you. Um, you know, as was, well, I mean, it's not face to face, but it's as close as face to face that we can get anymore. <laughs> I look forward to one day, like actually being able to do podcasts in person. Yeah, I can't wait for expos again. I'm going to find you at Tinley. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I can't wait to go back to Tinley. It's been driving me crazy, especially now. Like, well, the last time I was there, I think, uh, I was about to cross 10,000 subscribers, but, um, you know, it, even at that, it wasn't, you know, it, it was weird because some people recognized me, but most people had no idea who I was. And, uh, I was like really looking forward to going this year, you know, with five times the amount of subscribers and videos and, um, I just thought it would open up some doors that weren't open last time as far as like getting interviews with people and stuff like that. And then it's just yeah. canceled, 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 canceled. And it's like, ah. Yeah, I, I had actually put together stuff for my first, my first expo was supposed to be in March and I had bought all the extra swag and little temperature things and some tattoos for the kids and had upped my, all my species I had to be able to do a show and then February came around and here we are. So I think maybe next January, but I'm not, pushing it but that's when they maybe will have their first one and hopefully my application fee still applies because I, I, there's money on yeah. the table already <laughs> yeah <laughs> but. 
I feel you. Well, uh, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, and uh, I look forward to hopefully having you on again in the future. If you're, if you, if this wasn't too terrible of an experience for you. Oh, this was amazing. Like I said, don't don't put anybody, don't put me in front of Patricia. I need that free therapy session again. So. <laughs> when you start doing yeah. repeats. Yeah, I told her that <laughs> she's going to have to be a regular guest just so I can uh, I, I can benefit because <laughs> my health insurance does not cover therapy Absolutely. sessions. So uh, everybody like, we'll benefited. Get from you on everybody. normally. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Richard. That was, I love your platform. I love how you view the animals. And like I said, I sent you the ghosts just to get amazing care videos once you've cared for them for a while. But yeah, just the photos you take and the way you represent the animals is really bl- helping the hobby bloom the way it is. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I plan on doing a video on them soon. Um, it's, I've got like a list of videos that I, I am trying to work through. And then inevitably, like my calendar is actually, um, I I schedule it all on Google calendars. So it's like 2023, I think is (laughs) like, I have a video for each week all the way out into then. And inevitably something comes up and it's like, Oh, you know, I'm I'm going to, I promised this person I'd unbox whatever they sent me in a video. So then whatever that was, what was scheduled for that week, it's moved further on in the future. And some people get a little frustrated because it's like, Oh yeah, that'll be out in like two months. And then it's been six months. And they're like, where's the video? And I'm like, oh, I got pushed back. I'll have to move it, change the priority. So I'm well, sorry. They'll have to make their own video, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, you've really illuminated some things for me and I appreciate that. And I'm sure everybody else enjoyed it. So make sure you check out Arthropod Ambassadors. I got their uh, website and all their information scrolling across the bottom of the screen. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, if you're listening to the podcast, just uh, go to arthropods-ambassadors.com. Or just search Arthropod Ambassadors on Instagram or YouTube and you'll definitely find them. Uh, She's got some amazing videos. So, Aaron, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure and uh, hope to have you on again in the future. Thank you to everybody that's been listening. We we enjoy it. We appreciate it. And uh, keep coming back because I'll be uh, releasing a new podcast every week. Uh, for the foreseeable future. (laughs) I don't don't have any plans on quitting anytime soon. I got a lot of cool guests lined up and a lot of topics to cover. So thank you all for listening, for downloading. You can find the podcast on any podcast platform that you use. And you can also watch the video versions that are usually uploaded uploaded later on in the day on uh, the Exotic Pet Collective YouTube channel. So uh, thank you all for um, listening and we will see you next week. Goodbye. And we are clear. Yeah, awesome. that was awesome. Yay. <laughs> you did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thanks.